Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the first meeting of the committee in the new municipal year. The first item of business is election of chair. Is there a nomination, please? Thank Hi. you. I'd like to nominate Councillor Al Neil. Is there a seconder, please? Yes, I'd like to second Al's uh, um, proposed uh, chairman. OK. Are there any other nominations? OK, Councillor Neil, you've got the hot seat if you'd like to join us. OK, well, thank you. Um, right. Um, so the next item on the agenda is the uh, appointment of vice chair. So have we got any nomination? Please? Uh, Caroline? I'd like to nominate Councillor Andrew Mickleborough, please. OK. Is there a seconder? Yes, I'd like to nom um, second Andrew. OK. Are there any other nominations? OK, I think that's um, Andrew is the vice chairman. OK, so um, have we got any apologies for absence? Yes, Chairman. Pauline Jorgensen, Stuart Munro, and Graham Howe is here as a substitute. Thank you. Right. Um, minutes of the previous meeting. Uh, Andrew. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, I'd like to um, suggest that uh, one correction needs to be made. Um, page seven, paragraph two. RAG status should be corrected from red to green for on target. OK. Um, those who are here. Right. Can vote. Can we have a, um, just a show of hands? For, we agree with the meet the minutes. I wasn't I wasn't here last year, so I can't really vote. OK. Thanks. OK. Mm. Right, moving on to uh, declarations of interest. None. <coughs> public question time. There are no public questions and no member questions, Chair. OK. Right, so moving on to item eight, uh, Thames Water. So we have we have here um, Rich, Rich, Richard Aylard from Thames Water, who will give a presentation. Oh, sorry, yeah, and um, and a team, his team, J James Bentley, and. Emma Norris. James, welcome. Yes. Uh, so, yeah, good. Uh, welcome, Richard. Uh, you, you've sent us a presentation. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, I'm Richard Aylard. I'm the Sustainability Director at, at Thames Water. And um, very 
pleased to have been invited to give you a bit of an update. I know that river health is at the top of many people's minds, uh, and that's an area that I lead on. So um, perhaps I could start off by talking a little bit about how and why untreated surge discharges occur, and more importantly, what we're doing about it, and then touch on some clean water issues. Although, of course, we only actually supply clean water to about uh, just, just under half, half the borough. We do the north and the east, whereas southwest is with southeast water. So um, if we could have the first slide then, please. Um, this is the Wokingham Borough boundary, and those are the, um, the sewage works that we operate within and in some cases very close to the boundary. So if I just run quickly through those, and I'll talk a bit more about them in a minute, we've got Arborfield Sewage Works, which treats the waste of about 19,000 people, and that discharges into the Barkham Brook and ultimately to the Loddon. Sorry. We Sorry, my watch is saying it doesn't understand. Um, I hope you do. Um, we've got Ash Ridge, which is, of course, Wokingham Surge Works, which treats the waste of 13,000 people, and that goes into the Ash Ridge stream. We have Longwater, which is a small uh, small works, um, just, just over 1,000 people. New Mill, another small one, discharges to the Blackwater, just 600 people. Remenham Surge Works, treats the waste of 67 people. So it's not much more than a big septic tank, really. And of course, the big one, Wargrave, 119,000 people discharging into the, the Loddon just before it reaches the, the River Thames. But I'm conscious in having done these sort of talks quite a bit recently, that um, not everybody has a clear understanding of how a surge works operates and why should they? So for those who do, um, could you please bear with me while I explain to those who might be interested in, in hearing a bit more about this? And the way I tend to do this is to use an aerial, aerial photographs of a, a small to medium sized sewage work. So if we could have the next slide, please. So this is actually Kintbury Sewage Works in West Berkshire. But I use it because it, it, being quite a small works, it, things aren't boxed in and closed in. And it's not it's, it's a very straightforward uh, works. But the principles behind it are the same for all our sewage works. So if we could have the next slide please this is the inlet works now the inlet works is really really important because that's where we screen out all the things we don't want our lovely customers i'm afraid will persist in sending us wet wipes nappies um, pairs of tights toothbrushes all sorts of things that our bi biological treatment process simply can't cope with and we also get quite a bit of grit that comes in off the roads which of course plays hell with the pumps so the inlet works at a sewage works is really important. And we screen that out and that all goes, has to go off to landfill because it's it's mixed, mixed products. But everything that's gone through the inlet works, if we could have the next slide, please, goes to what we call the primary settlement tanks. And these do what the name suggests. They just slow everything down. And all of the solids, which by this stage have been well churned up, they just drop gradually down to the bottom of the settlement tanks and they get scraped off mechanically, automatically and taken away. And we use that sludge for um, energy generation. And I'll come back to that again in a minute. So once we've got rid of the gross solids, we then go to the next slide, please. We've got three what we call filter beds. These don't actually do any filtering as it happens. They're full of uh, what we call clinker. It's, it's a bit like pumice. It's got a very, very large surface area. And what that does is it gives the ideal place for bacteria. So we, a biofilm is created on the surface. And as the wastewater gently trickles down, those, those are about two, two and a half meters deep. As it gradually goes down, the bacteria that are in there treat the sewage. And this is the biological treatment bit of the process. It takes time and it takes air. And those two things together, um, by the time it's gone right down to the bottom of the beds, it's had the ammonia and the biological oxygen demand taken out. So it's basically then clean enough to go in the river. We put it through another process first. Okay, we can another click please on the slides. And this is the final settlement tank, something that's called a humus tank. And all we do here is re repeat the process from the primary tank and we just let everything settle out again. And what's settling out now is mainly the bacteria from the previous process. And that again gets taken away and goes off uh, for uh, for sludge treatment. And what's left is by now clean water. You could put it in a glass. It looks good enough to drink. And apart from a few bacteria, it probably probably is. 
And that goes, and the next click, please, out into, uh, in this case, the um, Kennet and Avon Canal, but more typically it would be a, a brook or a stream or a, or a river. And that process deals with the waste of about three and a half thousand people in two, in two villages. And it will keep doing that all day long, all week long, all month long without any problems. So what could possibly go wrong? Well, what happens after heavy rainfall is that the flows arriving at the works are more than the works can treat. It's a biological process. If you try and push things through too fast, it'd be like taking the Sunday joint out of the oven after half an hour. It's not cooked. And all that would happen is the, the same process would happen in the river, killing, killing fish and wildlife. So you have a limit to how much you can treat at any one time. And when that limit is reached, there's nobody pulling a lever or taking a decision or deciding to dump sewage. The excess goes over a weir. And it's exactly like the overflow in a bath. If you leave the tap running and you go off to make a cup of coffee, you forget you're running the bath. Rather than going onto the floor, it'll go down the overflow. And exactly the same happens. It's an automatic overflow. And it goes, we have the next click, please, into, sorry, nor five for a minute. It's gone one more. goes into two storm tanks. The first storm tank fills. When that one's full, it goes into the second storm tank. And then when the incoming flow subsides because the rain's stopped, it automatically pumps back from the storm tanks to the start of the works. So you use those storm tanks as a kind of a parking area for sewage while the flow goes down to the amount that we can treat. The problem comes, as you probably guessed, if the works is full and the storm tanks are full and the sewage is still arriving at the works. Now, the, works, the, the sewage comes via two pumping stations, one in each village. You turn those pumping stations off, you flood the villages with sewage. Not good. If you keep them going, you're going to put untreated sewage into the river. And if you try to block the process somewhere, the tanks are just going to go overflow anyway. So at that point, the permit for the site says, provided you're treating the minimum amount and your storm tanks are full and they're empty when you started, you're allowed to discharge to the river. And that's the bit that we regard as unacceptable. It's the way the system was designed. And for many years, people in my position would have been sitting here saying, I'm really sorry, we don't like this, but it's, but it's the way it's designed to work. Well, that's true, but it's not acceptable. When our new chief exec, Sarah Bentley, came in two years ago, she said, this isn't acceptable to me. It's not acceptable to our employees. It's certainly not acceptable to customers or for the environment. So the question is what we can do about it and how quickly can we, can we do it? And that's why we've made a commitment to get the total duration of these discharges down by half by 2030 and in sensitive streams, which would include the things like the Ashridge stream and the Barkham Brook, get it down by 80 percent. So that's what we've got. To, that's that's the challenge that's in, in, in front of us. And um, in looking at that, there are various things we can do. But before we look at what we can do, let's just go back to why this is happening. The sewage is not causing the problem. It's the rain that's causing the problem. So if we look, how does the rain get into the sewers? Let's look at the next slide. OK, so here you've got on the left hand side there, you've got infiltration coming in through the side of a sewer because the pipes aren't absolutely aligned. And you might think, well, that's dead easy. You just put a camera down and you find it. But in dry weather, nothing to see. And once it's been wet for a few days, nothing to see pipes full of water. So your window opportunity to find infiltration is quite limited as the flows go up and the flows go down. And we now have specialist teams who, as soon as conditions are right, go around lifting manhole covers, putting cameras down and quickly pinpointing where that's happening. And when that happens, what we can do is we can line, reline the sewer. We bring a, what a, a large, long kind of plastic sock through and in, in very dry conditions, heat it from the inside and it welds itself to the, the, to the sewer. But there's another problem, too, which is misconnections. So if you look at the picture on the right there, you can see that outside that house, and that will be almost all the houses in this area, you've got two separate sets of pipes. You've got the blue pipe, which is quite big. And the blue pipe takes all the water off the roof and off the roads. So everything that runs off surface water, it's clean. We don't want it, thank you very much. It belongs in the environment. We need to get it there via a brook, a stream, as quickly as we can. And the orange pipe, which is actually much smaller, and the difference in size is bigger than it shows in the picture there, that's the foul sewer. And that takes everything from inside the house, toilets, baths, washing machines, dishwashers, 
showers, etc. And provided those two systems are kept separate, things aren't, aren't so bad. But if you get a misconnection, if the blue pipe is misconnected somehow into the orange pipe, whether by a dodgy plumber, a mistake, a DIY builder who didn't quite know what they were doing, that surface water gets in from the blue pipe to the orange pipe and it fills up the capacity and then it either potentially overflows or it overwhelms the sewage works. So misconnections are a big issue for us and they're not easy, easy to find, but we do work hard to find them. If we go on again, next slide and click again. It's a manhole cover and you can see it's got those little square bits at the side. Now those are quite good for when you want to lift the manhole cover, but they're also designed to let it breathe. But if you've got water running down the street after a heavy, heavy thunderstorm, it's going to go straight down through those air holes. And that's also giving us extra flow that we don't want. Another click. And this is just an accident. This is actually in Buckinghamshire, so you don't need to look too close to home. Somebody has put in a cable for an electric charging point um, under, under the town centre and they put it straight through the sewer. And we happen to have a camera down there. We happen to find find it. But that would have been going on for a very, very long time uh, and, until we realised that something something was wrong. And if we go on again, we just skip that one. That's going to take a bit too long to explain. One more, please. And again. So here. That just looks like a bit of a hole. What's actually happened there is a farmer had a wet corner in his field and he decided he wanted to drain the wet corner in the field because it would be better for his crops. And he found a pipe and he knocked a hole in it. What he didn't know was it was a foul sewer. So the drainage from his field was arriving at our sewage works until some smart person realised something was going wrong and found that. So all those things mean that flows increase after rain. So if we go back to what we can do about the problem of the untreated discharges, the first thing we can do is deal with the problem at source, stop the rain getting in. But as I hope I've explained, it's not quite that easy. And if I tell you that for um, Wokingham alone, we've got 160 kilometres of sewers co coming in. It's, 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 it's a lot of searching, it's a lot of work to find, a lot of resealing potentially. So we will where we can. If we've got infiltration, we'll, we'll find it and we'll fix it. The second thing that we can do is we can build a bigger sewage works. Well, why wouldn't we? Well, why wouldn't we is because it's a biological process. And if you build it sized to cope with really, really wet weather, it's going to be very, very inefficient in dry weather. And this biological process, it likes everything. It's like us. It just wants the same conditions. It wants the same amount of food. It wants roughly the same temperature. It doesn't want to be spiking up and down all the time with trying to bring new streams on and off. So, yes, we'll increase the size of a surge works where we need to, but that would usually be to cope with population growth. The third thing we can do is build bigger storm tanks. Why wouldn't we? It's only concrete. Well, the problem with storm tanks is they're quite easy to build and they're very easy to fill. But you've got to get them empty. So once they're full, they're no use to you. You've got no spare storage. So last night, it was raining hard. We had lots of thunderstorms. Probably 30 or 40 of our sewage works, although I have to say none in this area, started filling their storm tanks. Those guys will have been working flat out all day to get those storm tanks empty and clean in case there's another thunderstorm tonight. Because if your storm tanks are full, they're no use to you. So you have to build your storm tank size and your sewage works capacity hand in hand, step by step. And it's those three things that we're doing in different combinations at different sites to improve, improve, improve the situation. Stop, it, get, stop the rain getting in, bigger surge works, bigger storm tanks. Those are the three real options we've got. So if we could go on to the next slide. I think the other thing to say is that although there's been an awful lot of emphasis, quite rightly, on storm discharges, that is the environment agencies um, estimate, uh, quite a detailed estimate for the Thames catchment of the things that impact on river water quality. And the blue bar to the right hand side, sort of midday to, mid to three o'clock, that's us, that's 31% Thames water. The green bit is agriculture, the orange is highways. And the proportions will vary slightly from catchment to catchment. But the point I'm making is that this isn't all down to uh, water and wastewater companies. So we are working very much at a river catchment level, 
trying to, to, to sort out what can be done to improve water quality. We're the biggest single cause, yes, but we're not the only cause. If we could go on again. So what we have now is we have what are called event duration monitors, and these are on all of our works which discharge to the environment. And you can see the four works that, that, that have the capacity to discharge. The two of the small sites don't discharge, they treat everything. And you can see there that you've got a gradual decline from 2020 to 2022. I'd love to take the credit for that, but actually it's mainly about the weather. 2020 was a really, really wet year. Some of you will remember. 21 was more average. 2022 was dry. We simply haven't had time to get the amount of work that we need to do built, commissioned, operating. Yes, things are happening. Those numbers are coming down, but it's going to take, take to 2030 to get to the targets we want to get to. But we decided as a company about the time that Sarah Bentley was saying this is unacceptable. We also thought, well, shouldn't we be telling people about it? We have an annual return, which gets published anyway, but why wouldn't we do a live system so people could see actually what is happening at every sewage works at the same time so that you could get it on your mobile phone, on your laptop at the same time as our operational managers get it. And we explored this and we decided that actually it was worth doing and we could do it. So we committed to having this information live on our website by the end of last year. We were the first water company to do that. Um, and actually, as a result, the government changed the Environment Act and said it was a requirement for all water companies. Because we'd already started doing the work, we were live on uh, 30th of December. And if we go on and again, you'll see what the map looks like. I hope one more click. Yeah, so this is the, um, this is the map. And you can see each of those dots is one of our works. The green ones, no discharge are taking place. Red dot discharge taking place now. Orange dot discharge has taken place in the last 48 hours. So you can see right up at the top there, you can see there was obviously a big thunderstorm around Banbury and Bicester. All those works uh, were, 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 were storm discharging, but actually everywhere else, it's quite, it's quite scattered. But that was the map that from this morning, 24 hours ago, the entire map was green. So it was the thunderstorms that, that, caused, that, that caused that. And actually making that map available, I mean, people don't like what it tells them. They'd like it to be green all the time. Why wouldn't they? But the fact that we're making the map available uh, has gone down well. There's some nice comments we've had there. Um, what we've done now is we've actually refined it. So when you click on one of those little dots, it'll tell you which sewage works it is. But it will also say, click here to find our plans for this site. So you can actually see there's 250 sites actually have plans and we can tell you what we're going to be doing and by when. And I'll come back to that in a minute. So that's the EDM map. If we just click on again, please. So um, here are the investment plans that I was talking about. Um, I'll just see if I can read them out because it's quite small print. Um, upgrade for Arborfield, improve ability to treat volumes of incoming sewage in wet weather due to complete in 2026. Also looking at what further upgrades might be needed uh, in the following five years to cope with future growth. Um, oh, thanks for <laughs> saving me cricket my neck round. Okay, um, Remenham uh, uh, is, is working quite well. It's only a very small site, no major upgrades planned there. Longwater, we're um, working to improve the efficiency of the sludge system. Uh, so what I talked about was when the, at the end of the process, the sludge is collected uh, by tanker, and then it's taken away to one of our big processing sites, and we generate a quarter of our own renewable energy with the sewage that you lovely people give us free every day. Um, there's an upgrade plan for Wokingham Sewage Works to improve the ability to treat volumes of untreated sewage. No date for that yet. New mill is operating well. No upgrades planned, uh, and Wargrave is going to get a big upgrade um, to complete in 2026. And again, potentially, we may need to go further to cope with growth in the system. So again, that's all being being looked at. But that, so those are our investment plans for for wastewater. So, Chair, that's really the um, presentation I was wanted to give to kind of set the scene for what's what's coming for the area. Um, I know you had a number of other areas you'd like us to address. Um, how do you want to handle those? Mm. 
I mean, I can take questions now, or we can we can we can go on to the other areas, or it's entirely up to you in your hands. Uh, well, I think I think um, it would be good to um, take questions on on the, on this on this area. I mean, I, I was I was thinking we'd um, split this up into into different um, batches of questions, so that we didn't, well, yeah. the questions weren't jumping around all over the shop. So. Um, I guess I could ask my colleague so Jim could, Bentley to come and join me as well. He's the uh, ops director for Thames Valley Home Counties. Some of the questions, so I suspect, were for James rather than me. So if we do it as a double act, if that's okay. Okay. So if, if we could, if we could, um, if we could, we could do um, ask questions on, you know, local discharge of sewers into rivers and waterways, um, action plans, targets, time tables, uh, time tables reducing incidents. So. so. Who's going to I'll make an item to read. Adrian. Okay, so uh, I think Graham Graham's first. Thank you very much. Uh, just by way of introduction, I'm the councillor for Romanum and Wargrave. So nice to have the smallest and the large. Did I hear rightly that Wargrave uh, caters for a population of 190,000? 119, 119. Still Well, it's a, it's a population equivalent. So there could be some business uh, waste that we're taking as well, but that gets turned into, it's, it's, it's the volume of sewage we would expect for 119,000 people. It might be 110,000 plus some business. But it's, it's a it's a big catchment that feeds into Wargrave Sewage Works. Yes. Lots of pumping stations, lots of sewers, big area. And and I wonder if, for my selfish benefit, yeah. uh, you could give me a little more detail on what the plans are for 2026. Well, they're, they're still being worked out. We're, we're clear we need to do some work. Uh, we've got a design team on it at the moment. Um, and I haven't had anything from them exactly what's going to be required, but it might be a new inlet works. It might be an additional primary settlement tank. It might be some improvements to the aeration lane. Uh, it might be just uh, getting some of the hydraulics sorted out because the flow around the works can get quite complicated. And if you want to treat more, sometimes just smoothing out, a bit like the exhaust of a car, just smoothing out the hydraulics can help. So we'll, we'll get you that in due course. If you'd like to have a look at the surge works, we'd love to take you around. Um, show you how it works and we could probably get a bit more idea before then of exactly what's planned but we've really only got the detail on the 2024 and some 2025 schemes at the moment just takes a little while to work through the design because one of the things about a surge works is you can't switch it off so it's like trying to service a car with the engine running so any upgrade to a surge works has to factor in the fact it's got to run all the time or well, the tiny ones you could you, you could take away by tanker but anything bigger than that has, has got to run the whole time. So it's it's quite a complicated process to, to plan an upgrade. Just one more to tag on to that, if I may. Uh, thank you for that invitation, and I'd warmly uh, take it up. Um, we, we can get, we normally take up about six rounds. So if you've got any friends you'd like to come, other councillors, um, let, let us know and we'll fix the time. Um, Not only councillors, but I was going to ask if we could uh, have some kind of um, explanation for the local residents not just in wargrave but in other places where yeah. there's these sorts of upgrades yeah the tour around the works because it's an operational site more than about six to eight people at once makes it quite difficult some of the machinery is noisy you can't hear so for a tour we'd say six to eight but we're always happy to come and do parish meetings or, or community groups it's the kind of explanation we're given tonight and we can obviously do it much more focused on an individual works rather than the whole the whole borough so happy to do that Thank you. That would be wonderful for both Remenham and Wargrave Parish Councils. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Good. OK, uh, Chris. Um, Apologise for the question because it's a little bit pointed. Um, the map that's shown here is just for Wokenham area, but quite a lot of the activity that happens in Reading affects a Wokenham population. For argument's sake, the, uh, the freshwater take is from the Kennet. At my understanding. So is there any indication of what other works is going on in that area that affects the residents? Well, Reading Surge Treatment Works is one of our biggest and newest, so there's nothing very significant planned for Reading 
uh, sewage treatment works. On the clean water side, I mean, there's a lot planned, and we'll come on to that perhaps in a minute through our water resource management plan. But I mean, the other big sewage works in the area would be Reading and, and Twyford and further upstream Newbury. But Reading puts its effluent into the right in the bottom end of the Kennet, where it then just before it joins the Thames. And that's that's a really high high quality effluent because obviously the Kennet is 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 an um, important river, um, and as I say, it's a very modern works. So there isn't there's not too much wrong with with Reading. I think we had eight storm discharges last year, which is eight too many, but it's it's uh, it's it's a relatively n- low number compared to some other works. But I, I just thought for the for the I just get the map of the borough, <laughs> otherwise we cover the whole of South of England. Appreciate that. It's, it is a difficult area when it's it's been from different things. Now the other one is a little bit more pointed. It affects the area that I live in, which is Three Mile Cross, part of Shinfield uh, South area. Um, and yes, there's been a lot of um, new builds been going on in that area. So there's, a, there's a, an extra load being put on the system. Mm-hmm. But historically, there's been an issue with the Graysley, uh or sorry, the Grazley Road pumping station on the, on the other side of Bainstoke Road, and the pipe work is susceptible to, to rainwater in, yeah. uh, ingestion, etc. And there is a, a new pumping station in Three Mile Cross that has a command line from sent to it, which switches it off when other systems are uh, turned. So I understand from what you've said earlier that that is a process you have to go through. Mm-hmm. But it's taken a long time for people to accept or attempt to accept it's actually a Thames water pumping station and it switches off. The alarm doesn't sound off. It doesn't get switched back on. And 48 hours later, we've got issues. And I've had to twice had to be uh, mm-hmm. put in a hotel because of sewage infestation in the back garden. And there are other houses yeah. around that. So it is a pointed question. Is, is there any plans to get that particular issue resolved because it's been going on for a good 10, 15 years? I'm not aware that there are. I live in Wokefield, so I'm not too far away. Um, but I will find out for you and I'll get you a proper answer. And I'm sorry you haven't had a, a proper answer so far. Um, it may be a, a, a pumping station that we adopted a few years ago. We took on a lot of private pumping stations. Um, and it has taken longer than it should to get some of those properly assimilated into the network. But um, I'm not going to guess. I mean, leave it with me. Um, I'll perhaps catch you afterwards and get the details, and then I'll come back to you in writing. Thank you very much. And James, you know. If I could just add to that. So I'm responsible for operations. So whatever might be planned in terms of asset improvement, sounds like there might be something for me to follow up with my ops teams about how they're operating the system as is. So Richard and I will talk to our respective colleagues and I'll I'll look into whether there's anything operationally we should be improving as well. Thank you. I do appreciate it. And sorry for hijacking you. Not at all. Uh, Catherine? <laughs> this is a question about um, paying for it, paying for in- improvements. What is the possibility of Thames Water using its own resources over the next 10 years rather than increasing charges to c- the consumer? to stop discharges of effluent into local water courses. Is that something that you're considering? Yeah. Well, the way that the regulatory system works is that the company invests whatever is needed to do the work. And then that money is recovered from customers over the lifetime of whatever it is we've built. Now, there are times, and every five years, we have a, a what we call a price review with our independent regulator off what who decides what work we we ought to need to do and then how much customers ought to need to pay for that and in the last few years we've actually been spending our shareholders been putting more money in and in some cases not getting a return on it but there's a limit to how much shareholders can do that because our shareholders are mainly pension funds and sovereign wealth funds so they're investing for the long term but the pension funds particularly have a choice about where they put their money. If they're not going to get a return on water, you can bet they're going to invest in telecoms or or energy or railways. So, you know, yes, you can always go a little bit more. And yes, you can do half a million here or a million there or do something a little bit a little, a little bit better. And shareholders are often willing to do that. But in terms of major investments, no company is going to be investing unless it's going to make some kind of a return, whether it be a dividend, a more valuable company, avoiding penalties, gearing itself up for the future. There's lots of reasons why 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 you would be prepared to put extra money in, but there has to be some kind of re- return at the end of it. And it's the regulator's job to get that balance right. And we've just coming to the end of a 10-year period during which the regulator 
uh, announced it was the decade of declining bills. So it's a pretty good guess what, what's happened to bills. They've come down. And actually, um, with hindsight, um, I believe, and lots of people believe, they've come down too far. So we're now in the business of working with Ofwat, with the government, uh, on what we need to do for the next five years and consulting our customers about it because they, they, they have a view too. And add to that, just, yeah. If I may just add to that as well, um, I think it's important to note that, I mean, a lot is said in the media, understandably so, about the performance of water companies. And as Richard said, Sarah Bentley has been very clear when she arrived um, that it's unacceptable, our performance. However, whatever the level of profitability that's been reported, Thames Water shareholders haven't had a dividend for five years. So, and they've put fresh equity in. So, uh, yes, the company can be profitable, but if those profits are have to be reinvested in the business because the business can't sustain paying a dividend, sooner or later, you know, a, a crunch comes. But uh, Sarah says, and I think this is a good way of describing it, we've got patient investors. Uh, to not have a dividend for five years um, and to put in fresh equity, which I believe is the first fresh equity that got put into the system since privatisation, because what happened other than that was people were buying the shares of companies, so they were paying one shareholder for for their stock. What's happened in this case is Thames Water shareholders have invested capital into Thames Water being able to make investments that they can't recover from customers because the regulatory settlement isn't sufficient for us to achieve what we need to do. So they haven't taken it in five years. They put fresh equity in. Does that mean everything's okay and we should be given an easy ride? That's not my point. But I think it's important to understand that there's something in the economic model here that uh, we need to get sorted out. And that's why this price submission we're making for the next five year period is so important. And whilst I understand what's behind your question, you know, to what extent should the company be using their own resources? I think five years of no dividend and putting money in, they kind of are. The shareholder has been doing that. I'm sorry, Adrian was next. Yeah, I, thank you very much, Richard, for the presentation. I thought it was really helpful, actually, to understand the works. And um, I think also some of the information you provided was, uh, you know, positive, showing a positive direction. Um, it's always good to hear that. Uh, also that you're considering, um, perhaps at the behest of Sarah, um, <laughs> The, uh, the aims and objectives to reduce discharges, et cetera, which I think has definitely come up the political agenda. My, my first question really is, um, and you said, I think, halfway through that, you know, that we are not happy with where we're at kind of thing. Um, would you say that in, in the first 30 years of being a, a sort of privatised company, you didn't invest in those years enough? I think with hindsight, it's clear that we didn't. But having said that, we were constrained in the investment by what the regulator was prepared to allow. So we didn't invest as much as was required. We certainly invested as much and more as the regulator built into the calculations. So I think with hindsight, probably at privatisation, there was an insufficient understanding because it had all been in the public sector. It had been very much a sort of forgotten utility. Um, people didn't realise what state the assets were in. That's why it's taking so long to get leakage down, particularly. That's the most the most obvious one. And then in the early years of privatisation, as it wasn't just the state of the assets, it was then much increased requirements on the companies to meet EU directives, both on clean water and, and wastewater. And I mean, James has been with the company long, on and off longer than I have. But uh, certainly when he and I first worked together in 2002, the, um, the mantra from the then chief executive was, above all else, we're going to have the lowest bills in the country. Um, and it was only when the uh, new CEO of our parent company came in and said, excuse me, Bill, but why is having the lowest bills a good thing? Um, that people started to think about what you actually needed to spend on the assets. I think it was always taken for granted that, you know, they were there and yes, they needed some work on them. But I don't think anybody did anything like the amount of forensic analysis that's going on at the moment of each each individual bit of kit. The asset health is being assessed. What do we need to do with it? So, I mean, as a, for instance, we're looking at 
every single bit of our wastewater infrastructure and seeing the extent to which it complies with its permit. You know, if we've got a storm tank and the permit says it's got to be nine and a half thousand uh, cubic metres, when did we last check? Is it really nine and a half thousand or did somebody build it at nine thousand and not measure? And some of these things that do go back 20, 20, 30 years and we're sorting them out now. James, you're dealing with this on a daily basis, so I'll probably better hand over to you. Well, I, I'm, I'm going to try and not comment on everything that you yeah. add to every comment, but I mean, I will, I will just say, um, I think if if we look back over the, was it 1989 that privatisation happened? So over the 34 years, um, you know, that in, that initial period, I joined the company. I had an 18-year sabbatical on the other side of the world, but in my first stint with Thames. You know, I can remember us celebrating we were spending a million pounds a day on investing in water and wastewater assets, which going back 30 odd years was you know, a lot of money. Um, and so I think that initial period post privatization definitely drove up investment in water and wastewater assets, not just in Thames, right across the, the country. But there was a period where there was a windfall tax. I'm not arguing whether any of these are right or wrong, right? That, that's not my point. But there was a, a windfall tax. There was also a, a rebasing of water prices in a downward direction. Um, politically, it's probably a lot easier to do a downward direction rebasing water prices than an upward direction. But from memory, and and if if the record shows that I'm wrong, we'll correct it. But I think it was something like a 13% reduction in water prices that were introduced uh, at a sort of rebasing. So if you do that, big windfall tax, big re rebasing, this is all kind of 20 years ago or so. It does have an effect on the ability of the company to invest. And then if you also have a regulatory system, as well as a an ownership and a leadership of the company, that's all saying, let's keep bills as low as possible. That whole system is going to result in less investment than otherwise would have taken place. And as Richard says, my teams are now dealing you know, on a daily basis with uh, the impact of asset failures. So Richard's been talking about sewage treatment works, but right across the, the kit that we operate, there's examples of, of failure. And our job as operators is to respond to that failure as quickly as we can. Um, if I can follow on. Um, I think it's really interesting that you say your chief executive had the wrong KPI. Uh, which shows that every, everybody from the top down can choose the wrong KPI sometimes. And, you know, it wasn't a sustainable future to have assets creaking and groaning over that 30-year period is what you're describing, essentially. Um, you also seem to indicate that you're get, getting to an asset register, and um, it looks like from your presentation you're getting to a... Um, um, a prioritised list of investments into those assets. One thing that I would like to see is uh, always the financial side of that. So what sort of money are you going to spend on each asset and when are you going to spend it? There is the operational aspects, which are really crucial, obviously, reducing the discharges, but also we want to know how much money is being spent. Yeah, just comment on that if I can. So, um, the, the price review process we go through with Offwatt is a, is a process where things are laid bare, as it were. So just at the moment, we're in the process of putting together our submission. So uh, for things that have not already been made public, you know, there's, there's a period where we have to respect the confidential, confidentiality of that process. But that's a, a, you know, it's a few months until we submit our price submission. So if you just bear with us for a little period of time, we have to treat that process with sensitivity. But the time will come not too far away from there where uh, we can be transparent again about the size of those investments. Uh, that, that's very good to hear. Thank you for that. Um, a couple of questions around specific instances. We had the Avondons Lane sinkhole, which was caused by a sewer, and the Elmsfield uh, sinkhole where another lorry fell in to because of a, a, another sewer, I believe. Were you satisfied with the performance of Thames Water and all its contractors around those two incidents? I think broadly we were happy with the performance but we weren't happy with the situation. I mean we very rarely get sinkholes uh, uh, and when we do it, it's 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 very serious but this particular one as you will know better than anybody uh, was immensely difficult to try and get that get that um, vehicle out of out of there. We were in touch a lot with the emergency planners. I think that that side of it went well. 
I'm not sure we were as good as we should have been in talking to councillors and residents throughout. I think there were good days and bad days, perhaps good weeks and bad weeks. It dragged on for a very, very long time. But the whole um, incident, both incidents have been very carefully looked at and we've learnt lessons both in what you can do in those kind of really extreme circumstances. Um, I mean, I can only think of one other sinkhole in the last five years and you to have had two in Wokingham just seems a bit unfair. Um, and as I say, that one was particularly difficult. Um, what I can say was 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 that there were, you know, that the whole company was very focused. Nobody was sort of sitting back and saying, "We'll get to it next week." I mean, we're genuinely trying a whole range of different things to get that to get that sorted, um, and making sure that we were properly in touch with local people. But I think the thing about communications is you can never do enough. However much you're doing, you ought to be doing more. Um, and we we do have quite a good communication set up now as part of our incidents. We used to have an incident management team and then they would call on, on, on comms to help. Actually, the comms work stream is now built into the whole incident management. Um, and I, I hope we're getting better at it. But I mean, if there are any very specific points you wanted us to pick up and take away, then more than happy to do that because it's all a learning experience. I mean, James, you and your colleagues are dealing with the incident management literally every day. There aren't many quite like that. No, indeed. And and look, if, if there are, if there are specifics you would want to understand a bit more about how, what we've learned and what we've done about that, I, I can arrange for someone to discuss with you if that's going to be helpful. I think that would be extremely helpful. I'd like to see the final sort of lessons learned report and have that presented somehow. And you know, if we could get the comms people to invite the residents, of, especially Evandon's Lane, which was severely affected, I think that would be a part of the comms wrap up to say, you know, we've learned, we've, we, we've found this out and we're going to change this, etc. That would be really helpful. Thank you. Sorry, can, can, oh, Andrew next. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, two questions, if I may. Um, the matter of water prices um, has um, arisen in discussion um, uh, in a number of contexts um, you know, this evening. Um, the first question um, uh, is about the cost of living crisis you know, that uh, the nation is going through um, you know, at the moment. And um, uh, a simple question, um, what um, measures are in force or in place uh, from Thames Water's point of view um, to help anyone um, in our borough and more widely who is really struggling um, with water bills at the moment? Uh, we do. Um, my colleague who runs the retail function um, of Thames Water uh, would be much better placed to answer this than I. But I, I do know that our the support we give to people going through hardship is, is growing, as you would expect under this uh, cost of living scenario. I can certainly come back with a, an answer in writing to what those arrangements are. But I, but I can tell you that they're on an on, what's available is on an upward path, and the effort that Thames Water is going to to reach out to people accordingly. But I'll I'll provide an answer to you. Uh, Subsequently. Yeah, I mean, brief, briefly, if people are on below a certain income, including housing costs, they can get up to a 50 percent reduction on the on their water bill. Um, and we've got several hundred thousand people on that on that now. It's called a social tariff. Um, and we are extending that because clearly uh, it, it's it's more important than it's ever been. Um, and we do. So, for instance, we'll be talking perhaps a bit about smart metering in a minute. But when we go around and talk to customers about smart metering and how to use water wisely and get the best from the system, we also do a quick assessment of whether they would benefit from being on the social tariff. So it's very much plugged into our thinking. OK, I mean, one of the um, purposes of the overview and scrutiny committees um, is to um, try to um, uh, improve things um, you know, locally and um, you know within the remit and the resources um, you know of the of the council. Um, and it strikes me um, that one of the matters that uh, we might um, wish to look at, make a recommendation on as this committee, would be um, uh, to ensure that our officers, all our officers, you know, who are dealing with um, our residents 
governments are aware of the types of support, including the social tariff, um, you know, that you have described. So further details about that, um, you know, would be really, really helpful. And then it's up to us as a council to ensure that our officers, um, you know, who've um, you know, dealing with our residents, um, you know, are also aware and able to um, assist with that kind of support. So thank you. That's really helpful. The other question, if I may, um, is that the matter of communications has um, uh, also, um, understandably, um, you know, cropped up um, a, a number of times. Um, and um, I just like, perhaps it's a little bit of an unfair question because it's so broad, but if it's possible to just sort of give a broad brush picture, you know, of how you see the state of communications between Thames Water and our council at the moment. And you might even want to drill down into a specific example, such as the uh, the Evenden sinkhole example. Did you feel, you know, that um, at all times, you know, the communications from involving all of the stakeholders, okay, not just yourselves, you know, but um, uh, communications with all the stakeholders, you know, were as efficient and as effective and so forth as they might be. Um, and um, linked to that, do you see opportunities, and again, this is in the spirit of improvement, do you see opportunities uh, for um, uh, uh, for better working together um, between Thames Water and our council, um, you know, for mutual benefit. Well, yes, and I'd like to start by welcoming the suggestion we should work together on on, on um, affordability, because it's our aim to get the number of people on the social tariff up as quickly as possible. So if we can talk to your officers, we can make materials available, we can give, uh, you know, contact contact points within Thames Water to help with that. More generally, we uh, we have 99 local authorities across our area and we learn from all of them and we learn different things. Some councils want to do it one way, some want to do it another, but there's a lot of ideas that we that we cross fertilise. And my colleague, Nikki Hines, who's not actually here tonight, is our local government link through to, through to the borough. Um, but I hope you'll always come through to me or to James if there's anything really urgent that you feel you aren't getting the help that you, that you need. Because um, particularly when things go wrong, we do talk very much to the emergency planners. That's that's really a, a, our first port, port of call because they're the ones who can help us with, with the resources, uh, with getting things fixed quickly. Um, but we do also put quite a lot of emphasis on communicating with individual councillors. And it doesn't look as though we got that right on the Evenden Road sinkhole, so we can, we can, we can look at that. Um, as I was saying earlier, communication is one of the things where you can always do more. Um, I'm not. Um, I had a very good meeting with your former leader sitting at the back there um, a few, few few months ago, which was very helpful. I learned a lot from that, um, and I think we can learn more from tonight. So what I'd like to do is, is you know, standing invitation to, to you know, let, let's let, let's have a chat. I mean, if the things that you know you or officers can see being could be done better, then let's see what we can we can do about it because it's in all our interests. We're serving the same people; they just have different labels. Could I just add, just briefly, if I could add to that, that one of the reasons that um, we've, my job has come along, is that we, we used to have one operations director for the whole company. Um, and there's this little place down the road called London that sometimes could dominate the uh, attention around that. So we now have two operations directors, one for London, and then I have all of home counties in Thames Valley. So in addition to Richard's role, which is very outward facing, working with councils and so on, uh, I'm, if you like, the the person from the the line, if you like, that uh, is accountable to stakeholders in Thames Valley and the home counties. So you know we're 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 doing everything we can to make sure that we are more accessible to places outside London because you know newsflash, it's not all about London. I've got. Andy, then Caroline. So, Andy. Thank you. Thank you, James. And thank you, um, Richard, for and to your colleagues for, for coming along this evening. Um, you, uh, James, I think you said that um, shareholders have, haven't had any dividends. It seemed a little bit too good to be true. But that, that's only true of um, external shareholders, isn't it? Internal shareholders, according to Google, took me three seconds received £37 million in dividends this year, and that was up from £34 million last year. So dividends are still leaving the company. They're just staying within the, the broader corporate structure. It's so well, that, that's not really a question because <laughs> I, I, I buy you a very a, a strict definition. You're right. that It's not leaving to these uh, 
as you said, to the, to the pension well, funds, but it is leading to other parts of your corporate structure. But those who in those who are in those who are the owners of the shares of mm. the group are not receiving dividends and haven't done for five years. So um, we we can get you the we can get you the financial description if you like. But if you read in the media what gets leveled that we make hundreds of millions of pounds a year of profit and all that kind of stuff, whatever the accounting profit, it's not being distributed to to shareholders. So. But but it, it is it's still leaving the operating company. Well, and then it's being then they're investing much much more than that. Several you know okay. order of magnitude. I, I, I just investment. I just wanted to be clear that. Well, I, let, let me get let me give yeah. you a written reply. Yeah, please. Because do. I'm uncomfortable. Yeah. I'm not an expert in that. You may be. I didn't. I, 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 no, I, I thought not. <laughs> so if you googled something and I haven't, I, I think rather than us argue about how to interpret that, yeah, I will get you a written reply to how to, to describe that. Yeah. But whatever number you just quoted, I can tell you it's. An order of magnitude or more that shareholders have invested with no dividend in the last period of time. So, so you know, but I'll get you at the specifics of that point. So I'll make sure that I've got a record of that so that I'm not misleading you in my answer. Thank you very much. And my, and my actual question was was about um, was was more to to was that perhaps to both of you. Um, you you're looking at why um, uh, you've been explaining why we've been having the overflows. Um, you, you haven't in, you haven't mentioned changes in the number of consumers or producers i guess in in, in your business because in this area in particular we've had like 15 or 20,000 more more houses something like that and that doesn't seem to have been mentioned has that not provided any additional stress to your systems well what we try and do is we work very closely we are not um statutory consultees on individual planning applications we are on local plans so we, we we actively consult on local plans we rely on good relationships between our developer services team and the council officers on individual planning applications what we try and do is get the longest term view possible of growth in the area and then we will expand our surge works to give ourselves a bit of headroom and that headroom then gradually gets eroded over time, and then we expand again. Bearing in mind what I was saying earlier on about not making a surge works too big too quickly. So typically every, probably every on average about every 10 years, a surge works will be expanded to cope with population growth. Now there's a bit of a twist to this because provided we only get the foul sewage, it's a relatively small increase and the surge works can cope. But if the development is done badly, or misconnected, and we get the surface water as well, we get an immediate problem because it is many, many times the, the factor bigger. So we are really trying as hard as we can to make sure that what tends to happen is developers produce lovely plans of what they're going to do, and those plans get signed off. And then they subcontract the work, and sometimes it gets subcontracted again. And sometimes the people who do the work do it in the quickest way and cheapest way for them, digging the hole, making the connections and filling it in, whoever's going to know. Well, we'll know the next time there's some seriously wet weather when our pumping stations start getting overloaded. And then we have to go back and dig down and developers gone. So there's a lot of effort going in now to make sure that things are connected up as they should be, because generally speaking, we can cope with the foul flow. Um, it's 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 the surface water flow that gives us gives us the problem. So we are always trying to have the works expanded, to have spare capacity, which, as I say, gradually gets eroded. What we don't want is big surprises. So we do rely on council officers and our own kind of scanning of the media so that when people are saying there's an extra 500 houses here or 500 houses there, then we can say, right, when's it coming? What do we need to do? Which works will it be? Which network will it be? So all that does get factored in. Uh, Caroline? Thank, uh, thank you. Good evening. You have answered most of the questions. But I, can I bring it back locally? You said that Wargrave does discharge into the River Loddon, and I assume these events are happening more and more over time. So when we have a lot of severe weather, the River Loddon floods quite badly in early. Should we be worried about the discharge into the River Loddon and onto major green areas? So when I said discharged, I'm talking both about treated effluent, which, of course, is going out 24-7 because people's, once we treated it to the, the good standard, it goes into the river. But also that is also where any untreated effluent that we need to discharge because, it, uh, uh, because the site is overloaded will go. 
but the volume that actually comes out there compared to the flow in the river after it's been raining is a tiny proportion. So it wouldn't be sufficient to make any measurable difference to the flow in the river. So I think the flooding needs to be dealt with as flooding by the Environment Agency and riparian owners. The little tiny extra bit proportionally that would come from an untreated discharge from a sewage works isn't going to tip the balance one way or another. Thank you. Sorry, Andrew. Yes, thank you. Um, Richard, I'd, I'd like to just pick up on a point that you made um, a moment ago, um, um, uh, in which when you stated that um, Thames Water is um, a statutory consultation, a consultee uh, when it comes to local plan um, uh, updates, um, but not for individual planning applications. I'm assuming including ma for, um, applications for major developments, which of course could involve many, sometimes hundreds um, um, uh, of homes. So my question is, um, First, it's 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 really again in the spirit of trying to bring about improvements locally. Okay, and my question is, um, uh, what is Thames? What approach is Thames Water taking um, um, uh, in terms of um, the? Uh, current development of our local plan update. We're going through the update, uh, the local plan process at the moment. Would you say that you're taking a proactive approach um, um, uh, uh, in terms um, of perhaps flagging up um, you know, any concerns that you might see as an organisation um, uh, in these very early stages you know, of the local plan update and um, how again it's going back to communications you know how well do you feel those communications you know are are taking place at the moment are there opportunities perhaps for um, um, uh, for trying to um, uh, improve on those i can't answer how we're actually getting on with your local plan at the moment, but I can get back to you. What I would say is that because we are not statutory consultees on individual planning applications, we make a big effort to get involved at the local plan stage because whatever we can learn and whatever we can say and inspectors listen to us and it gets built in, that's that's really helpful from, from our point of view. So those local plans are, 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 are really, really important. Um, but... The other thing we can do, of course, on individual planning applications is we can recommend what's called a Grampian condition to the council, which means that uh, we which means typically that we have some works we need to do to upgrade a bit of infrastructure to cope with the development. And we'd ask it isn't occupied until that point. And obviously we don't impose a Grampian condition. The council does, but we can recommend it. And we're increasingly doing that if we're concerned that not to do so would give us a problem. But I, I will get back to you on the individual question of your your local plan. No questions. Okay. Um, any, anyone else with that? Any, anyone else um, with any questions? So, Richard, did you want to tell us about some some other things? Well, I'd just like to brief, briefly say that our smart metering program will be coming to Wokingham next year and we'd very much like to book a, a slot with the council please at which we could present our plans um, talk to the council talk to the highways department um, because we want to roll out smart meters across the borough we've rolled them out across london we're now working out across across thames valley and we want to start work early in 2024 i.e early next year and we think the right time to talk to the council would be probably september time so that's all part of planning for the future, because we find that once our customers have a meter, they typically use about 12 percent less water, sometimes a bit more. And of course, these smart meters, because they give us 15 minute readings, um, really helpful in finding finding leaks, particularly on customers' properties. If the amount of water you're using doesn't go down to zero any time during the day and night, probably there's a customer side leak. And we can then get on and fix that. So smart meters coming to Wokingham next year. This is one thing I wanted to try and get on to the agenda. Can I? OK, and to add. Thank you. Um, if there aren't any more questions at this stage, um, some of you will know that was your hand up, Norman. OK. Are we moving on to other things or is this OK? So. 
I really want to just raise about the the water main side of things. You know, we, we do seem to be having quite a number of bust water mains, and clearly they cause quite a lot of disruption to properties and and roads. Um, specifically, uh, where I live in Airlie, we've had we've had quite a few, and even more specifically, the uh, verge outside my house a few times over the last twenty years. So there does seem to be a problem with the, the types of mains in some parts of the borough. I believe it's sort of plastic that was thought to be okay, but it turns out to be a bit more brittle. They bust and you get a great big sort of fountain. I just wonder what you're doing about um, investigating that and, and gradually replacing those sorts of sections of, uh, of water mains. I can't talk specifically about your area, but that's not to say we won't come back to you on that. Um, burst water, bursts, leaks, all these uh, associated losses of water. I mean, it's as important to us about the the saving of of water as it is the cost of the the, the asset that needs replacing. Um, there is so much scrutiny going on in the company around our leakage performance and our burst mains performance and the regulator on behalf of the customer does a very strict job i have to say on us in terms of the penalties we have to pay if we don't meet leakage targets or we have too many burst mains and so on so uh, you know it's a matter we take very seriously um certainly pipe material plays a part but so does um the, the leakage work that we do, you know, sometimes small leaks become big bursts. It depends on the type of pipe material and the, the types of conditions and so on. So we have uh, a whole incident, instru incident structure in place in the company where my colleague from London happens to be the overseer of that one on all matters related to lost water, leakage of water. He and I meet with the, the team who work on this weekly. We uh, we meet with the CEO fortnightly, all around this topic of how we're ensuring we're doing the best that we can in terms of reducing lost water. Now, lost water into the leakage is one matter, but burst pipes in terms of the disruption it causes to communities and the damaged properties, yet another thing on top of that. So all I can do is assure you that it's you know, the very uppermost in the priorities of operations and, in fact, the whole company. As for your local situation, I would have to get back to you on that. Oh, uh, Catherine. I have a similar question to the one I asked before about um, paying for um, reducing leakage. Um, I, I understood that there was a hope that it can be reduced by half by 2050. And I wonder whether you were putting your own money into that or going to put it onto consumers. Um, some of the investment that's been made by shareholders so has been made to be in a way that it's ring fenced for particular activities. So some of that money is ring fenced for additional leakage work. So yes, we are allowed to recover some of the costs of our leakage program from customers. And every five years when we make our pricing submission, we um, we have to meet, we, there are performance commitments that are put in place around how much leakage will come down by, what what impact will have on reducing pollution events and so on. If we don't meet those targets, then the regulator has levers that they can pull that reduces our revenue next time round. So whether we pay for it direct, if we don't meet our targets, we'll pay for it indirectly by having less revenue allowed for us than we would otherwise would have had. But in a proactive sense, some of the money that shareholders have made available um, over and above what we're able to recover from customers has been reinvested for leakage. So it's a mixture. Some is being passed on to the customer and some is being paid for direct by the shareholder. And if we fail to meet our targets, then the regulator has an opportunity to reduce our revenue two years later to, you know, if you like, re repay to customers indirectly by their bills not going up by as much as they otherwise would have done. Andy, first and then Alison. Um, thank you. Um, with all of the new estates that we've had in this area, one of the issues which does seem to come up every now and again is that 
one of the reasons for the delay in new roads being adopted by the borough is that the borough is waiting for Thames Water to sign off on whatever the sewage and such is. Um, and I, I won't sort of ask you about any specific ones because that's not fair, but I was just wondering um, how high a uh, priority that sort of sign off of uh, new infrastructure projects is and whether you monitor the sort of responsiveness of, I'm, I'm presuming you have a team or of your teams which are responsible for this. Yes, we do. We have a developer services team who work with, with developers and in the same way that we have something called CMEX, which is the customer measure of experience, how well the customers think we're doing. We have a DMEX, which is developer measure of experience. So developers do you know, report back on, on how well we're, we're doing. Um, there are sometimes reasons why uh, particular pieces of work can't be completed. Sometimes a main has to be flushed with, with chlorine to make sure it's completely uh, uh, sterile before it can be, it can be occupied. Uh, there are other problems that we can have in connecting things up. But what I would say is if there are serious delays occurring in the borough and you don't think it's being dealt with quickly enough, then please escalate it because we're not in the business of wanting to keep people unable to occupy houses because we haven't finished the infrastructure. Um, they, they, every situation is different, but we're always happy to investigate and work out what's what's going wrong. It may be our fault, it may not, but we, we certainly need to get these things sorted right behind somebody here so i'm just scurrying around so no i think the the the, the feedback we had was was from our planning officers and it was um i'm, I'm trying to think that and there that the sense they got was that there weren't enough people at thames water and i think that they actually gave the quote i don't know if anybody else was in the meeting but they said there was just one or two people was, uh, who were acting in effect as like a, a a funnel through which everything had to go, and that was the reason for the delay. Now this 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 was back in 2020, so right. maybe things have changed. Well, but that was certainly the feedback we had then. I mean, I certainly talk a lot to the head of head of developer services, and I can tell you he is absolutely focused on on getting the, getting the job done and providing providing a service. And I see him doing this all the time. But if it, if it's not working for you, please let us know about it. I mean, that's three years ago. If it's still not working, we'll get onto it. Uh, I'm I'm just wondering about you. You're talking about you you liaise with the developers, but this yeah. is more about the liaison with with the borough highway. I guess it's with the borough highways team because they're saying we've got this road. We're not going to adopt it. Uh, does the developer come into that? I don't know. I'm not a planner, but yeah. I, I, um, all, all I'm saying but is this comes more to people who aren't signing off. Yeah. Well, if we can get some 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 times and dates and places, I, I can work out what's going on because uh, it, it, you know we're responsible for 4,000 square miles. There's a lot of people, um, a lot of boroughs, and uh, I'm not saying we get everything right. Um, and if we're falling short, then let's learn the lessons and get it fixed. Uh, Alison. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming this evening. Your presentation has been very informative. Um, we're all very aware that we're, we're in a, a climate emergency. You know, we're working hard to uh, become carbon zero by 2030. I understand there are targets to encourage an, you know, a reduction in the amount of water that's used by 2030, but this is something we hear very little about. Um, I know it's, it's right across Europe. You know, there's not a limitless capacity to provide clean water. What are Thames Water doing to encourage residents you know, to be more efficient in the use of the water to reduce the amount of water they use? Well, the first thing is fitting these smart meters. So as people get a smart meter, then first of all, they know how much they're using. They have an incentive to save. Um, and we do see at least a 12% 12, 12 reduction in water use. So fitting meters is really important. Um, more widely, the government have set a target of getting down to 110 litres per person per day. Um, we don't know how they're going to do that. Um, we can do our bit. Um, we can talk. To, we, can, we can fit metres. We can uh, encourage. Uh, we can do what we call smarter home visits, where we go and actually talk to people about their water use and how they can use less. Explain how if they use less hot water, then they're saving on their energy bill and their water bill, and they're saving carbon. So we can do that sort of thing. Um, we are also, for a long time, we've tried to get the building regulations changed to encourage water efficient homes. And um, to put it mildly, the government's response has, has been unenthusiastic. Um, they're not prepared to do anything that uh, makes life difficult for developers. So the building regulations changes we want, the industry wanted haven't, haven't happened. It's taken us 15 years to almost get a white goods labeling scheme for water efficiency. 
So 15 years ago, we set out to say, really, you should be able to know whether your dishwasher and your washing machine are water efficient or not. We're almost there now. Um, it's been a long, hard road. So we've actually changed tack on this and we're now working with developers. And if they will build water efficient or even water neutral houses, we'll give them a discount off their connection charges to our system. So if you build a water neutral house, it's something like just over £2,000 off for a developer. If he's doing 100 houses. That's, that's, that, that's quite a lot of money. And it gives them the incentive to then start working on um, rainwater harvesting, rainwater, grey water recycling, the things that are really tr you can do them at a one house scale, but it's not really efficient. But if you've got a development of 100 houses, why wouldn't you do rainwater harvesting? And why wouldn't you do grey water recycling with some minimum treatment? And this hopefully gives them the incentive to do that. It's early days, but house builders actually came out and welcomed it. They don't welcome many things, but they like this one. So that's that's part of it. But I think more to the point, it, it's going to have to be the whole of society is going to have to get behind this. I mean, I don't know about you, when I was growing up, a paddling pool was about this big and about that deep. Well, you can go on Amazon now and you can get one that has four, takes takes you know eight thousand liters for fifty quid. So you know every time it gets really hot, water demand goes through the roof, um, and people are also watering lawns more. Um, we ha we have to find ways of getting water usage down. But the other thing is, when we talk about average water use, people think that perhaps there's a curve that goes up like that and down like that. Actually, the curve goes up like that and then down like that. We have a very long tail of people who use a huge amount of water. And that is where, again, smart metering comes in because we can start targeting those properties and trying to find out why they're using all that water. And we find some really interesting things. Um, but potentially that's giving us the kind of information that we need to say to people, of course, you might have a leak, but equally, we've got people who are running hairdressers from home. They're doing poodle parlors. We found cannabis factories. We found all sorts of high water use activities. Uh, I'm not joking. <laughs> we do find these things. Uh, and all this is what we he, actually need to do. He gets all the fun I stuff all in our fun. job. I have to say. But to these are the things we need to do because we have got to get, I'm not sure we're ever going to get to 110, uh, not in my lifetime, perhaps, but we can certainly get to 120. Um, and we've just got to keep going. I'm sorry if that's there's there more that the borough council can do to, to help with this. I think getting the water efficiency uh, messages across that actually, you know, having a water butt, um, uh, simple things like turning off the tap while you're brushing your teeth, you know, it doesn't sound very much, but if if millions of people do it, it's it's going to make a difference. And we just have to, we have to change all. I think we can do more in schools. We're trying trying to work hard with schools programs, um, but the the climate of this country doesn't doesn't help. You know, in my previous job in job in Thames, I used to sometimes have to be talking about uh, water efficiency um, standing under an umbrella. You know, it's it's not a good look. Um, you you can really get these messages across when the weather's hot and dry. It's more difficult the rest the rest the rest of the year. But I think public awareness is gradually going up. I mean, I've seen seen that trend over the 20 years I've been with the company, but there's a long way to go to get to where we need to. And would you mind if I just say a couple of comments on that? Uh, so I've just spent six and a half years in Australia. Pe people think I'm Australian. I have no idea. I think we can all agree I don't sound Australian in any way. But apparent, some people claim there's a twang there. But one of the things, if I, if I compare, so I was the deputy secretary in the New South Wales government looking after water. And I was putting pressure on Sydney Water to compare themselves with the water utilities in Melbourne. Now, the numbers are higher because the weather patterns are higher and all that kind of stuff. But in terms of relativity, before the big millennium drought that happened, obviously, the, around the time of the millennium, but we're talking about many years of drought, sort of eight, nine years of drought, Sydney and Melbourne residents were using about the same amount of water, which was, you know, 250 plus litres per person per day. During that drought, both cities and their water providers and whatever worked really hard with their communities. And during the drought, they got it down to the order of sort of 180 litres per person per day. At, then the drought ended and the company that I then, now had regulatory and policy responsibility for kind of took their foot off the pedal because the drought was over. In Melbourne, they carried on going and they got down to 155 litres per person per day. So. All I'm saying is, you know, that 
you can work with your communities and it takes a joined up effort from different levels of government and water providers and academia and media but if we take a system view of these things you can achieve amazing things in terms of water reduction and it can be sustained for long periods of time and so i i used all the levers i had on sydney water and i'm proud to say i got them to reduce their consumption by about 20 percent over the three and a half years i was there so you know, big changes can be achieved, but you need a burning platform or a driving force. But once the burning platform's gone, you, you, you got to keep it going and not turn it off. And so I think that's where we've got to work together between water companies, councils, different layers of government, and take a systems view of this, this thing. Because, I mean, the, the prize is enormous, but just the deltas that I saw between different water companies in Australia. And if we believe our climate's going to become hotter, and when it's not hot, it's raining. But when it does rain, it's raining more heavily. It sounds a bit like the eastern seaboard of Australia to me. And and you know, so if our weather's becoming more Australian, then the the delta we can achieve by trying or not trying in terms of that water reduction should become bigger. So I think if we all work together, we can achieve amazing things. The other thing I'd say in terms of planning policy stuff, we had um, across Australia after the Millennium Drought, any house that was built uh, had to be built with a water tank. Um, but then if you don't have the right enforcement in place, after a period of time, we went and checked a third of the water tanks, which at vast expense had been built into these houses, uh, weren't being used properly. And in fact, they were getting no benefit from the water tank. So just putting the policy in place without the enforcement and the the ongoing continual effort, you, you can end up wasting money. But I definitely believe planning policy change could be a massive factor in reducing water use, but we need to keep our foot on the gas and all work together as different parts of the system. Okay, um, Andrew? Okay, if there aren't any further questions, I want to just um, uh, begin um, by um, commenting on or just reiterating what James has just said. Um, you know, he said that if we all work together, we can achieve amazing things. And that's absolutely correct, I'm sure. OK, and it's in that spirit um, that I have been making very detailed notes um, of potential recommendations that this committee may wish to make, OK, in order to try to progress these matters for the benefit of us all. And um, so what I um, and there is actually a very long list of potential recommendations. Paul Neal is going to not be very happy because I'm not great with the precise wordings. He's a master at uh, getting them into the correct format. But I'd like to begin by suggesting the first recommendation uh, be that the chair of this committee write to Thames Water, summarising the key points and recommendations made during this meeting with an invitation for Thames Water to return at our meeting on the 16th of January to participate in a review. This would be a joint review with Thames Water and our officers as well to look at what progress has been made um, on um, uh, uh, many of the matters discussed tonight. So that would be the first recommendation. What would be the best way to, as I say, there are quite a number of recommendations. What would be the best way to deal with these? Neil, can we perhaps get your advice? Well, if you read them out, uh, Andrew, then I will make a note and we can turn it into a document which we can share with the committee just to make sure everyone's happy and then share it with Thames Water. If everybody's happy with that, I know that's a procedure that we've followed before very successfully. OK, so in no particular order, OK, um, the second recommendation um, is that um, uh, the committee um, uh, would wish um, uh, to uh, publicise um, the offer from Thames Water um, uh, that they can make available opportunities for site visits uh, to sewage workers. That could be for members of uh, this committee or any councillors or members of um, uh, local towns and parish communities. So a recommendation um, noting that offer um, you know, from Thames Water. Richard, you look as though you're well, wishing to respond. To that. I'm, I welcome that, but I would just say it will be small, organised parties rather than kind of open days because the, the amount of work in organising that is, but the sm more, small parties work best. Perfect. That can be captured, Neil. Thank you very much. OK. Um, and very, very uh, closely linked to that, um, a recommendation um, 
um, uh, that Thames Water, uh, that that towns and parishes be alerted to Thames Water's um, offer again to provide briefings for our towns and parishes. Uh, the next recommendation um, um, uh, is um, to arrange for further discussions um, on lessons learned from the sinkhole incidents. Um, and I think that uh, flowing from those discussions, some sort of written uh, statement uh, that could be brought back to um, the January meeting, okay, uh, specifying what lessons have been learned. Yeah, but I, I want a public meeting, right, as well. I want the public to be invited somehow, uh, the evidence residents to be invited by Thames Water or this council or whoever to a meeting where they can uh, be presented with the lessons learned. Again, um, Neil, can the minutes reflect that? Yep, you're happy with that, Adrian? Yep, good, thank you very much. Okay, um, the next recommendation um, uh, is concerned with uh, the need for the desirability of engaging with our officers um, uh, to ensure that um, that they are aware um, of the uh, supports available to people, yeah. um, including the social tariff, okay, uh, for people, our residents who are struggling with water bills. Yeah. Richard, could I just couple with that um, awareness of our priority services register? This is where people who are elderly or disabled and couldn't, for instance, get to a bottled water station if the water went off. Can, if they're on the register, we'll get someone to deliver it to them. But I just link, link that as part of the offer that we'd be wanting to publicise. Uh, Richard, I didn't get the precise term. It's, um, called the, it's called the priority services register and we have 350,000 people on it, but we're keen to add more. So. If we could make that part of the briefing, that would be good, together with the social tariff. It's two things, really. Andy, on this point? Very quickly on the, on this, and I think probably one of the, 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 the point relating to the cost of living. So th this is just in relation to the uh, retail offering, isn't it, it's rather than the sewage offering? Oh, yes. This is, this is if... If the water, if it was an interruption to supply yep. and the water goes off and, and we have to say, you know, you can collect bottles for yep. the next two hours from such and such. Um, people who are, who have particular medical problems or, or, or are elderly, we will um, have all the details. We'll phone them up and we'll get bottles delivered to their houses. So it's a it's a it's a thing we're working on with with other utility providers. Well, and I, I understand that. And yep. I'm familiar with the. Sorry. I'm, yeah, I'm, no, I'm just thinking a bit. But, you don't cover the whole bar for retail. Customers. I'm sorry, no, so it would be the I'm Thames just, Water, I'm just you're quite right. Of, yeah, it's, well, it's, and it's the same with the rollout of the water meters. It's the north correct? and east of the borough, yeah. So it's only some of the borough. It is only some of the borough, you're absolutely sorry, correct. We, we can give you a map, we've got a map of which shows which bit it is. There's a, there's a roughly a northeast to southwest line across the borough. So again, Neil, if that can be reflected um, within the recommendation, it's a good point, Andy. Um, the next is that um, recommendation um, is that um, the, this council um, uh, takes up the opportunity to book a slot uh, for Thames Water to explain the smart uh, metering program. And I think that you uh, suggested uh, possibilities in September. OK, um, my question would be, and perhaps here you might be able to offer some guidance, uh, Neil or Callum, um, who and, and members, um, you know, who would be involved in this briefing? Well, can we discuss that with Thames Water in terms of how it might work? And we've got a bit of time if it's September and then come back with yeah. the proposal. We should be yeah, with we members? can, because, of course, it would only be certain wards because <laughs> um, it would only be the Thames Water wards. But we can certainly organise that with you. Yes. Good. Thank you very much. OK, um, next, um, following on from um, uh, one of Andy's questions, um, there was mention made of the DMEX data. Uh, this was in the context of um, um, performance performance monitoring when it comes to developers. Is that is that correct? Well, DMEX is really a way in which developers can express their satisfaction or not with the service we provide. I think probably to get 
to the problem. We should we should be talking to the people who are having the issue, which in this case seems to be the planners and highways. If, if its developers are unhappy, then DMEX is a way of expressing their view by marking us down. But I think we're looking here for constructive solutions. So I think I'd like to be talking to the planners and highways and saying, can you give us some for instances of where this hasn't worked and how we can do it better? OK, so could we turn that into a recommendation, you know, that um, uh, this committee asks um, that uh, highways and planning, planning departments uh, communicate with Thames Water um, any concerns which they have uh, with regards, for example, to the adoption but uh, with the adoption of streets. Is that correct, Andy? Is that it's, it, it, it's the speed of the process rather than an outcomes, we appreciate account outcomes are engineering based, but it's the speed of the process. Yeah, well, we can organise a meeting with our developer services team, or, or you can give me some for instances and I can show them and say, what do you got to say, for, say about this then? Let, let me um, get back to whatever's easy to the group you. of officers yeah. who, who, who raised this with us. Um, and the final area for recommendations, I think, was that really interesting, important discussion about climate emergency. Um, and I would like to propose a recommendation to say that um, uh, WBC um, uh, does all that it is able, you know, to support water efficient uh, water um, uh, um, uh, water efficient homes, development of new water efficient and new uh, water neutral homes, uh, exploring, for instance, you know, any potential opportunities there might be through the new borough design guide um, and to support water efficiency communications, including some of the communications which I'm sure Thames Water, um, you know, um, uh, produce on a regular basis. Alison? So is that something our climate emergency scrutiny committee could look at about uh, water usage? Because uh, as the Borough Council is supposed to be a, a champion leading example, the way we're cutting our carbon usage in our buildings, encouraging schools, etc. Um, it'd be, be good to see some data about the, the steps we've already taken in the Borough to reduce water and what, what we're planning to do in the future. It's an open question, Andy. I'm not putting pressure on you. <laughs> Um, the, as you may know, the the latest version of the SEAT report is coming to the scrutiny committee. I think next week or the week after, and we can see what's in there, and then perhaps take it on from there to see if there's water or not. It's, I, I can't think of any mention of it, but it's also something I think, as the guys have mentioned, it's something the local plan perhaps needs to take up. Is it? Um... We'll look at the forward programs, won't we? I think later on in the agenda. Yeah. So, um, are there any more recommendations? Is everyone happy with um, the recommendations that Andrew's to um, proposed? Andy. Obviously, that they our guests be thanked for coming and giving such good presentations. I'm giving up the time this evening. Yes. Yeah, so say thank you very much to Richard and James for um, coming to this meeting. Yeah, well, thank you for having us. It's been a really good discussion. Uh, right, okay, so um, agenda item nine, um, Q4 performance monitoring report. Um, so, all right, and uh, yes, uh, Louise, Louise Livingston will introduce it. Um, before um, uh, Prue Bray um, it, it comes in uh, regarding the report, I just wanted to draw your attention to, I'm afraid, a couple of mistakes that are in, in the report, and I just wanted to correct those um, uh, on, on our behalf. So I just wanted to just quickly go through those. Firstly, what I do want to just state is the actual KPIs themselves, um, they are 
completely accurate. Um, where the issues are is where we've added up the red, amber and greens um, on the um, covering report. They do not match. So I just wanted to just quickly give you a summary of that information and just correct those um, for, for the record. And again, make apologies and ensure that going forward that that doesn't happen. So it states on page 22 that there are 40 KPIs. So first of all, and I'm not quite sure why this has happened, but it's just, uh, as I say, it's actually 41 KPIs. If I then just bring you down to uh, further down that page to look at the analysis, um, the eagle-eyed of you will have no maybe noted that things don't add up. So I just wanted to explain um, again the green, um, amber and reds. So on quarter four's performance, it should be 23 green, seven amber and four red. That adds up to 34. And then there are seven that are NA and not categorized. I will come back and just explain that in a moment. For end of year, it currently the um, the actual figures should be green 19. And sorry, this is uh, referring to, I apologize, to the pie chart that is on page 24. I, ha I haven't got, sorry, apologies. When, when we go through KPIs, we normally, you know, have got them on screen and we're looking at. So just to be clear what we're looking at at the moment. Yeah, can somebody share a screen? I mean, if we can't see them, how we could, how can we debate them? I believe they're in your agenda. Oh. OK, they're just coming up on the screen. So just so you're aware, I was referring to page 22, which was to do with the quarter four. And when looking at the diagram, it actually states at the moment, it states 24, yeah, 20 and green, nine amber and four red. The correct um, uh, numbers is 23 green, seven amber and four red. And then it was on page... 24, which again, just looking at the diagram of the um, set out there, it was just again to correct the numbers that it should be a green 19, amber 10 and red 3. Chair, can I ask a question on this? Uh, yes, go ahead. Um, firstly, it's, it's not complete if you're missing the not applicables. So that's clearly an error. Um, um, you know, every categorization has to be in there to get to 100%. So this diagram does not represent 100%. That is clear. You, is that agreed? I appreciate that and agree. And I was just about to say the um, the non-applicables, which are um, new uh, KPIs that were set for 22, 20, uh, sorry, for 23, 20, no, 22, 23, get there in a moment, apologies. Um, are, they don't have baseline data, which is why they haven't been correct, categorised, but you're absolutely correct. That pie chart should show those NAs. So the NAs for quarter four would be seven and the NAs for quarter, um, sorry, for the end of year would be nine. So that, that would then make the correct pie chart. And I, I agree that they should be. And then that is the whole number of the 100% categorised. Um, I'm a very stupid person. However, one thing um, that I really object to is representing completely different data in one graph. So in this graph, what we're talking about is adult social care, children's social care, bins, highways, everything I presume is in this diagram. What how would you describe this diagram as presenting any sense whatsoever? 
Um, I mean, you're adding apples and pears and bananas and, you know, it's it's nonsense. Um, I, t I take your point on um, board, councillor. Thank you. Um, obviously, what we're looking to do is give a whole corporate view of all of our um, performance indicators. Um, obviously, I'm very happy to work with the um, committee to see if we want to present that in a different way um, so that it can be as meaningful as possible. Um, I, you know, I, in my previous work, I did KPIs for 20 years. Nobody would ever present anything like that in a real business. Sorry, councillor. All right, sorry. Can I cause, um, go to Prue, in, um, who's on who's online? Th thank you, Al, because I feel like I, I've come here to, uh, it's not my normal role, but um, because the person who would normally present it, Sarah, is unable to attend tonight. All Louise is doing is presenting what was presented last year and the year before and so on. So I wouldn't blame her for the presentation. However, I tend to agree with Adrian that it's not terribly meaningful. Um, but it all it does is give us an impression year on year or whether we overall the organisation is doing any better. What you will find on in Appendix A is the full list of KPIs done by Directorate, which I think is far more meaningful, um, although I would counsel against the committee trying to examine every single KPI um, in front of it for reasons that the um, other overview and scrutiny committees quite often look at these in more detail in, in their areas. So children's services, for example, would look at the children's services one in a great deal of detail. So if you actually want to know about this, Andrew as, as the chair, putative chair, because he hasn't met yet this year, um, would, would be looking at those and be able to answer those. So um, I would agree with you that it would be better to have the not applicables in there. Um, this is this is. A method that's been used before and if the committee doesn't like it the committee should ask for what it would like to see i think um, and and um it's not louise's fault that they're they're like this so, well you know in my previous jobs you know we're in all yes. sorts of industries but you would never add you know premiums and losses and capital and revenue together mm -hmm. which is what this diagram is doing it's nonsense it really needs to be removed no. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, if I might, Chair, um, suggest that um, uh, we could look at making a recommendation about whether or not, uh, in future iterations, um, you know, to continue with those overall um, pie charts. But let's move on, um, you know, from that um, uh, now. Yeah. OK, back, back to uh, you. I, I was just going to just add that I'm very happy to meet with the councillor as well, just to, to go through and get feedback, because, as I say, that, that that's what we want. Um, we're always looking to make improvement wherever we can. OK, if um, you'd like to carry on, Louise. So um, just with regard to then um, the remainder um, of the report and just to give a very uh, quick overview, obviously appreciating councillors may have specific questions. Um, so the covering report um, picks up um, some of the key points that we just wanted to bring to, um, to your attention, um, which I'm sure you've probably read and seen, but it's just about the capital funding from DfE for two send free schools. Um, leisure participation leisure cent cent in leisure centres are recovering. Um, sorry, and successful bids in the social housing decarbonisation fund um, for, of 292k, um, which will bring just over 100 social houses onto an EPC rating C by 2025. Um, three community vision sessions with 150 plus attendees um, and with community representation from 50 um, different organisations. Um, the council's also received four um, nominations for the 2023 MJ Awards. And again, there's detail in the report um, of what these are. Um, as I've said, there are a total of 41 KPIs that are measured. The append and this is measuring um, the from January, February and March. Um, 2023. So it's the performance for that period. Um, and then, as I said, it does then give a summary of for end of year. 
Um, you then have the appendix, which is Appendix A, which sets out then in full detail um, the different KPIs um, by the different directorates. Um, and as I say, we're here to try and take any questions that you may have with regard to um, this particular report. Um, OK. Right, Adrian first. So we've got Adrian, Norman, Caroline, Alison. Um, could we turn, uh, Callum, to page 37, please? Okay, here we have RA4, which is the return on investment of the property portfolio. Um, and it's a request really probably to Graham. Do you, do you consider that the the value of the assets in the property portfolio should also have a KPI, or do you disagree? Um, yes, thank you, Chairman. Um, possibly. Uh, I mean, there's all sorts of things we could add to the PI suite, and it's always a balance of trying to pick the most meaningful ones. But there's, it could be added. Uh, I, I think this is the most useful one from my perspective. And um, valuations fluctuate hugely or year to year. And they're often very dated because of the nature of the valuation process. So um, if you wanted to see a quarterly change, you wouldn't. Yeah, I did. I, I wouldn't propose a quarterly change. That doesn't make sense. I agree with you. But maybe at least a, a, maybe an annual change. And, um, you know, the value of the portfolio would be certainly of interest to me, um, especially as we see pressure on other councils. Um, but in relation to this specific one, we see here the, the actual rate of return. Um, how is that actual rate of return defined? Um, I can. I'll need to clarify because it's about it's about arriving at the all the um, deductibles to arrive at the net income yield, but it's um, it's based on the uh, passing rent versus the initial acquisition cost. Um, but I. I can come back more with more precision, but that's broadly it. Uh, I, su I suspect there's slightly more complexity to it than that, but that that effectively tells us that in terms of what we the outlay was, this is the passing rent. Yeah, a, a written answer sentence. would be perfect. Thank you, Graham. And obviously, this is we can see a consistent decline from 4.75 to 4.71 to 4.62. Um, what sort of actions are being taken to move this back to green? Uh, okay, well, first of all, if, if I give you some context, um, obviously uh, various national um, economic pressures are uh, making an impact on investment funds across the country uh, and beyond. And I would say to sustain this level uh, is extremely impressive in that national context. You no doubt would have heard of uh, the plight of Woking, not Wokingham, uh, and the fact that they've gone into very drastic uh, financial measures and interventions based on the fact that their income yield effectively fell off a cliff well you can see that isn't falling off a cliff uh, and it's actually still uh, some way ahead of borrowing so i think a bit of context is really important i i would say i'm really happy with the way this has held up when you take the national and even the the local uh, context economic context into account um we we are working constantly to uh, try to 
improve the returns through making sites uh, lettable, attractive, getting the right people in and trying to realise the the highest investment return from the tenants. But um, obviously not all of that um, by a long way is in our gift. So it, it is a focus, but I would really strongly urge you to take into account the national context uh, and therefore read this in quite a positive regard, even though there is a decline. Okay. And could it prove got a hand up? Yes, so uh, uh, just to to um, provide the executive's view on this, we are looking, uh, if you read the service narrative, it talks about um, the office market, Denmark Street and Mulberry, which two of which are in the uh, uh, investment portfolio and steps are being taken to, to try and um, improve the situation for both those properties we were told about that last week so we are on trying to keep on top of it and i know officers are trying to keep on top of it i i really put my hand up to say the woking word um so i can absolutely understand why adrian wants to know what the value of the properties are because woking being a district council with a revenue budget of 16 million i think we were told today and uh, a pro property um debt mainly from property of over two billion pounds and uh, revenue uh, cost of servicing that debt is 55 million, which is approximately uh, several times, well, it's more than three times their entire income every year. So that's what you can get into if you don't have a good Section 151 officer like Graham, who, who has allowed that council to get into a terrible mess. I just can't imagine what they were thinking of. Um, you know, when times are good, it's fine, but you've got to manage your risk. And I know that the audit committee will also be looking at, at that kind of thing when they look at the risk register and our exposure and, and so on to debt. Um, but I think it, it might be worth um, you as, as a committee asking for some figures about the value of our property once a year or something like that, just to satisfy yourselves that we're not going in the direction of working. But I'm pretty sure that we're not. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for the clarification, Pro. If I can move on to a follow on uh, another question on page 39, if you can get to 39, Callum. Um, I think it's the bottom part. It's the capital budget. Yeah. Um, this is another question for Graham. I'd like to. I'd like to understand really why there's a significant 11.62% underspend on the capital budget. Uh, yes, I, again, all, all this um, will be reported to executive, the capital program as, as well as the revenue um, outturn, and that will identify all the specifics. But what I, uh, I so it's going to be a whole combination of factors but i would say that this in in previous years one could say that underspending against the capital budget means we're not setting out to deliver what we said we would do and it's been a very conscious effort this year in again in the financial context of escalating borrowing interest rates uh, and uh, spikes in inflation, which I are starting to settle in certain areas, that as much as possible uh, is either curtailed altogether or postponed into future years, as long as it doesn't have a significant impact on the services. And that's the approach we've taken through the capital budget monitoring process throughout this year and will re be reported to executive in July. So it is a whole host of, of, of things. And for, for example, um, the housing companies spend has reduced quite significantly the pipeline. Uh, and again, an, a lot of this is, is about trying to avoid expenditure where we can in order to make the financial pressures 
on the council uh, as palatable as possible. But all, all the detail you asked for will go be published with the executive report in July. Thank you very much for all the answers, Graham. Really appreciate that. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, Norman. Thank you. It's just a small, small thing, really, but uh, might be important. On CS3, the percentage of children in care, uh, page 64. It's about the percentage of children in care were 20 miles plus from their home, uh, from their homes and out of the borough. It does also say that um, some of the parents have, have moved out of the area and the, the kids with them. It does say some of these families. I just wonder of the um, number of people outside the borough, what, what percentage, how, how many that represents? It could have quite a significant impact, I suppose, on the, uh, the percentage. It doesn't seem sensible if they're staying with their close family members that we, we count them as, as being, a neg being a negative. Okay, Prue, okay. would you like to answer? Something I actually know something about more. Than that, so, um, good, good. So, <laughs> this is this is complicated because children are, can still be technically in care even if they're placed with their families or close family members. So they still um, they still count as being in our care, and they they can move wherever they like. I think some of them have moved to the northwest, for example. Um, two or three families um, and so um, and we can't prevent that but they still count against our figures and so we have to account for them in this figure. Um, the other complicating factor is the number of um, unaccompanied asylum seeking children who who are in our care. We don't, they don't all arrive with us um, from arriving in the borough because there's a national allocation which is 0.1% of your number of children. And I, I can't remember exactly how it's calculated, but for our, our purposes, it works out to a constant figure of 41 unaccompanied asylum seeking children. And they get allocated to us by the government from a list of children, because so many of them come into Kent that Kent can't cope, essentially. So they're, they're um, shared out amongst the rest of the councils in the country. So those children could be anywhere when we get them. Um, and um, I know there's at least one in somewhere like Plymouth and there's some in London. Um, and so they're automatically outside our area. They never come. They will never have visited Wokingham, some of them, but they still count against our total. So it's it's a it, it's not going to look great because we, we can't really control some of it. Um, but we do what we can and we are. Um, as those of you, I think some of you are on corporate parenting panel, we, you will know that we um, are quite good at fostering, for example, and um, local fostering, but it's getting more pressure with increasing numbers of children to, to get people locally to foster. Um, and so if you know anybody who will help us with the foster care, that would be really good because that will enable us to keep some children nearer and not put them out to independent foster agencies. We, we don't do a lot of that, but it, it would help. So it's a it's a movable feast and, and a complicated one. So um, there's there's all sorts of statuses of children and and um, where they go is not always ideal, but but we're doing pretty well actually, given the circumstances. Does that make sense? Is that an answer to your question? It, it it does, and it, it you've you've just pointed out that it's even more complicated. Yeah. yeah. If I could is, just uh, also add to that, Norman, if it's okay, mm -hmm. um, in my capacity as uh, chair of children's services, overview and scrutiny, and also member of the corporate parenting board, uh, you are absolutely right. You know, to raise this as an important issue, and it I can assure you that uh, this um, uh, uh, is scrutinised very very carefully um, at each of the um, uh, each meeting of children's services and also uh, overview and scrutiny and also of the corporate parenting board so um, absolutely share your concerns uh, but it is something which we are looking which we continue to look at very very closely okay, thank you I mean it would probably be useful to uh, to take out or to, to also show the figure um, where kids are not with close members of the family and to take out also the asylum 
a seeker sort of unaccompanied children to show those those figures separately so that uh, we can get to the bottom of you know really what the core of the issue is which is if we do have children in care we we sent more than 20 miles away um and they're not with family that that would be the the core that i think would want to be concentrating on so it'd be useful just to 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 know what those numbers are i think as part of your scrutiny process thank you so uh, andrew do you, do you just can we, just just on that point then andrew uh, on children's services um do you um drill down more deeply into these figures uh, yes, we do, but I've taken on point uh, on board Norman's uh, suggestion that perhaps we could uh, further disaggregate um, uh, these, you know, this data. I'm sure that uh, the data exists, okay, um, and you know, I think it would be useful, you know, to to further dis. But I'd I'd also like, if it's okay, Chair, to bring in Graham on this point because, of course, he has a huge amount of experience and knowledge on this as well. So. Um... First of all, the numbers are relatively small, so that can shift the percentages a lot. The complications that Prue talks about are absolutely right. Um, but also, there is a certain amount of uh, identity protection. So once you start going down to deep dive, and we've discussed this at Corporate Parenting Board, then you can actually start to identify individuals and that's not desirable for anybody. Yeah, sure. Okay, um, Caroline. Thank you. Um, on page 29 under places and growth and also on page 33, in children's services, we've got challenges. Do we have an action plan to overcome those challenges? And if we have, is it possible to have it in the report at some point in the future? Thank you. I will, I will, sorry, Councillor, I will double check. I'm still just getting myself a bit more familiarised with this report. And um, as part of that, I will make sure I look into that for you and, and come back with an answer. Thank um, you. Okay, Prue, Prue's got an answer for this. Well, I've got an answer for the children's services bit on page 33. I've, I've forgotten what the other page was. Sorry, Caroline. Um, so we do have shortage of secondary school places. There is a plan for addressing that. Um, and the education, health and care plans are being addressed under the enormous piece of work that um, is our send improvement plan, um, part of which is to do with safety valve, which is the scheme that we're in with the government where they are writing off some of our deficit in return for us also um, assisting with that and getting our spending under control. The recruitment of children social workers is a is the number one challenge for I think the whole of children services across the country. Um, um, we do have a plan but I'm not going to tell you that uh, we're hopeful of a major success in that. Um, and we're looking at and we are looking at all the other issues, the capacity issues. So there are plans for all of those in children's services. I'm sure we could arrange for um, some sort of um, presentation, but it might be better again at the children's services overview view and scrutiny. And then because that's the kind of thing we discussed there. And then Andrew can feed back to you um, after that. And what was the other page? Twenty nine. Twenty nine. Oh, that's I'll leave Graham to do that. <laughs> That's, that's not me. I'm, I'm, uh, Thank you, Prue. Yes. Um, yeah, I think this is um, this is place and growth, actually, uh, isn't it? Yeah, this. But it, but it's money, and I'm not uh, sure. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, well, I, I can pick up some specifics and, and I understand George is, is with you that can talk about others. So um, achieving a balanced budget, um, relentless work, the plan is relentless work at CLT level uh, and uh, with uh, our reports to do all we can to deliver on the savings targets 
and um, reduce expenditure. Everything has to be a carefully scrutinized value for money consideration and we'll be working with the executive, the relative lead members and executive as part of that work. And we'll be reporting back uh, throughout the year in terms of our revenue monitoring. And then we'll be bringing the uh, medium term financial plan propositions to achieve a balanced budget to um, scrutiny in uh, papers will start going out end of September and then into October, November, December. Um, I make no bones about this. This is going to be an extremely challenging year, given there are service efficiencies of almost £12 million in the financial year 2023-24, and that is more than double any previous year. So that was required to set a balanced budget, and that will be... Um, an awful lot of the work that goes on, whether it's in place and growth, resource and assets, chief executives, adult social care, children's services, and obviously from a corporate perspective. Um, if I was going to cite you the most significant risk and challenge, it will be uh, both working within our 23-24 budget and minimising the impact of anything unachievable, flowing into 24-25 and the emerging pressures that are coming uh, out both this year and will be coming out next year. One example being homeschool transport and the figures aren't small. Um, I'll move down to bullet point three. Uh, we're working closely with the uh, developers and also land owners were appropriate to uh, and also with Homes England to try to find a way to address the funding gap and we've got uh, we, we've been for a number of months now working with Homes England on a bid uh, that uh, we're hoping that they they will find palatable uh, but they do require us to to push this as far as we can with our developers as well so that they can ensure that the public purse is appropriately targeted. I, I don't think I should necessarily, I think George is better placed to speak on the others, but I think bullet point one and three, obviously I'm quite closely involved in. Thank you. Okay. Uh, George, would you like to um, add anything to that? Yeah, thank you, Chair. So just picking up, I suppose, where Graham left off, um, in terms of well, the second bullet point, I think members will see there's a theme, really, um, where the cost of living crisis is having additional pressures, pressures on the service. And you'll see that in terms of homelessness uh, uh, requests uh, for service in that area. Um, so there are pressures emerging uh, and equally as the bullet point sets out pressures emerging where there are campaigns uh, around uh, a mold and dam, for example, which is creating a request to come into the service. Um, that's all good in that requests are being made, but of course it does put pressure on the team. Um, and you'll see in the commentary that uh, where there, are, there is pressure on the team, resources are being considered to make sure that we can manage that successfully. And indeed, where you've got things like uh, uh, temporary accommodation uh, uh, officers doing extreme, extraordinarily well actually managing that pressure and keeping uh, numbers down to a, a minimum. Uh, Graham's covered the third point on the uh, South Wokingham Distributor Road. I won't cover that point again. Uh, recruitment and retention again, I think it's cross organisation, uh, not just in the place and growth directorate, but there are particular pockets where there are issues and resources uh, are very difficult to come by. For example, building control is one acute example uh, where it's very difficult to recruit staff. There is a national shortage uh, and the council has done very well in terms of encouraging uh, officers and training officers. Uh, but all councils need to be doing the same in order to grow the number of uh, professional officers there is within the pool to, to, to draw upon. So it's a cross council issue. It's a cross, I think, sector issue as well. Increasing population, I won't uh, dwell on, but clearly that's having an impact in terms of the demand on services. 
uh, national planning policy framework and the and the last point about five-year land supply so the council continues to lobby government in terms of their position on uh, the planning policy framework which, will, which members will acutely uh, know that is uh, considering uh, options of whether the council's position to having oversupplied homes uh, can now be taken into account in future housing provision uh, and the council's lobbying very hard including meeting with uh, the local MPs to make that case and pushing the government to express a view about the MPPF so that we can uh, move forward one way or another with our local plan, which of course the local plan and its adoption will will uh, essentially uh, rectify uh, the five-year housing land supply, which is the last point. Uh, happy to take any other questions, Chair, if that's helpful. Thank you. Okay. Oh, uh, Pooh, Pooh, did you want yeah, to say something? I had my hand up to make that last point that George made about the um, uncertainty about the um, the national planning policy framework changes um, and that we are meeting with the local MPs uh, about that to see what they can find out for us. Thank you. Uh, Caroline, do you want to? Um... No, I was just going to say thank you for the very full answers and I've written loads of notes. Thank you. OK, uh, Alison. Yeah, so, it's, so well, it might be a question for Louise rather than Graham. Um, looking at um, RA9, which is on page 40, um, it's got a target that changes every quarter, which isn't something I've ever seen before. Um, I just wondered why that was. Why, would, um, why we have a KPI of a changing target? I mean... No, it's a, that's um, that's a good point. I can only um, suggest it's because um, the actual performance uh, kept exceeding target, so we pushed the target up. Um, in which to give case, us something to show. Yeah, in, in which case, I questioned why you didn't do the same on RA three on page thirty six, which is you know usage of the borough leisure centres, because I think we could all have expected that once Carnival opened, that figure was going to um leap up as it did um so i just wondered what your target might be for the next quarter because clearly you know the target 127,556 or more is is very low you know you're smashing it by 101,000 now uh yes agreed for consistency if it, uh, assuming my previous answer was the explanation it's the only one i can think of uh, that should also have applied to this as well. Obviously, um, well, the, you know, and behind this is an extremely positive development. So we yeah, I mean, I mean, Carnival's fantastic. Bournemouth is a great leisure centre. So you know, I think you know, so, we had full expectation that they'd be well used and, and well done on those projects. Uh, yes, yeah, sorry. When when I said development, I, I didn't mean the actual building of the asset. I meant the development in terms of the trend. We were coming out of, um, well, we still are very much in a cost of living crisis. We had the the, the tail of COVID, which um, is still there in in some cases, uh, and I and I think that turnaround, um, I think it really marks the fact that it was such a a blight on this particular area, it, and for for it to to have turned around to the extent it has, I think is it, it shows how much it was was damaged in the first place, uh, how much it's recovered, and therefore, uh, I guess there became, as we exceeded initial expectations, there became there was obviously an inconsistent approach of amending the target. But obviously, we'll move into next year with a much clearer baseline, and you'll see in the covering report the return of the levels of usage in the leisure centres uh, are, are extremely good, both in terms of a local position, uh, but also nationally in terms of all of places, leisure sites, we are in the top three of their uh, percentage return uh, and they're pretty close to pre-COVID levels. So. Uh, so I, I think uh, I take the point about consistency. My main response is this was an, an extremely turbulent area, very damaged and has come back extremely well. 
and an awful lot of work has gone into that and obviously we'll set next year's baseline uh, for, on, a, on a much firmer footing. Yeah, I think the adding up's gone a bit wrong there because I don't think we did have 8,044,000. I think there's an extra four in there maybe, Louise. Yeah. <laughs> so, and I just wondered if you could just pick up then on with RA10B, the, 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 car, the residential with Carnival Hub that's clearly uh, is still delayed. Um, and I know you you stated you're confident it will be completed later this year. Is that uh, very confident? Um, right, okay. We we this in the context of the whole town centre regeneration. This is obviously a significant, but a relatively small part of the whole of the town centre regeneration, which which I think was an extremely positive program altogether, and. Uh, survived uh, to a large extent the impacts of the economic crisis uh, and COVID etc um, and but this particular area obviously suffered through the contractor going into liquidation and then us having to do some remedial works to make it uh, wind and water tight as best we could and then to push ahead with the most substantial um, piece of completion and uh, we are uh, very close to enacting that procurement um, uh, piece in terms of going out to get the contractor um, to uh, finish off these vital pieces of work. Uh, regardless of um, this has been difficult and obviously the fact the contractor went into liquidation was outside of our hands, but we have managed to protect what's there and we our best estimates at the moment are that if we proceed which of course we will do um through the uh, procurement that's just we're embarking upon uh then we do believe that we will at least cover uh the cost of expenditure which i think is a uh, would be a great feat given uh the challenges we've had on this particular part of the overall town center program Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, firstly, I'd like to um, begin by thanking Louise um, uh, for your presentation and to everybody else who has um, uh, spoken, answered questions uh, so far this evening. Um, I'd also like to draw attention to what I found found to be very, very helpful service narrative explanations um, in the appendix, appendix A. Um, so um, I think that they are very informative um, uh, indeed, and they actually head or, or help to provide answers to some of the questions that might otherwise um, you know, be anticipated. Um, my question though, um, is to you, Louise, if I may. I believe that you have um, a role in um, uh, uh, HR within the uh, council. Um, and we know that um, uh, there are a lot of issues regarding staff recruitment, retention, abs and, and, and staff absence impacting across departments, across the whole of the council or most parts of the council and we know that different departments and service areas um, you know have strategies in place to to tackle these we've certainly seen some of these um, as was alluded to earlier tonight um, within children's services and social worker recruitment and so forth so my question is more at the higher council-wide level if I may um, and I'd like to ask two things, um, um, uh, if possible, um, you know, could you summarise some of the borough-wide challenges facing multiple um, departments? And secondly, are there any contributing factors that require an overarching council-wide response? i.e. in addition to that of individual departments? And are there any new council-wide initiatives that you or you might have heard other officers um, you know, discuss um, uh, that are currently being considered and or that you might like to implement but have perhaps not done so yet. But I'd like this at the sort of the, uh, the macro level, council-wide level, if possible. Thank you. Um, I do note that uh, Graham Evers has actually put his hand up, but I'm very happy to answer in my role as um, Assistant Director of HR and OD on a number of these points. 
Um, but with regard to obviously the work that we um, are currently doing, um, the council obviously has um, made quite a commitment to HR um, over the, the last uh, few months, um, with me starting in November of last year. I'm now working with the HR team um, with all of the different directorates. We have um, what we call a business partner model in place where each of our business partners is getting to know each of those directorates so that we can get a good understanding of the different types of issues that obviously are concerning um, you know, different professions. Um, as was pointed out earlier in, in um, PNG, it's looking for specialists in surveyors. Um, highways is another area where we need to look for um, those specialist officers. Um, also within the team, I have an officer that is now dedicating their time to recruitment so that, again, um, with regard to um, making sure that we are tailoring our recruitment um, to the needs um, and to the market, because the marketplace, as we say, is quite difficult and very competitive. So it's also about um, building Wokingham's brand from the point of view of being an employer of choice with the training that it offers and develops its staff. Um, so as part of that, um, what we are in just embarking on at the moment, right up at the corporate level, and we're working with the personnel board um, on, on these matters, is a people strategy, um, which will set the parameters um, for, for the council. And then obviously from that people strategy, linking up to the community vision and the council plan, so that we are delivering on the objectives for the community with the workforce that we need um, in, in place. Um, with regard to um, just some of the more specifics, and I hope that I'm, I'm answering all your questions, uh, but please correct me if, uh, if you want any further information. Just with regard to absence, just to give an example, um, we're re-looking really at our policy um, around absence and that um, those concepts are going to personnel board um, this month um, and that we'll be working. We have a forward plan now um, in place with the personnel board looking at a number of different policies and initiatives. Um, we're also um, obviously making sure that um, we're giving timely data to our directors and assistant directors and in fact the whole management team so that they can again um, act on, on what's needed. It's, it's very much about facilitation and working with, with each, each manager. Um, I hope that's answered your question, Councillor. I appreciate there are others on the screen that probably may have follow-up that they want to come in on. Uh, yes, I think Graham. Uh, yes, uh, Thank you, Chairman. Yeah, in addition um, to those that Louise, Louise rightly pointed out, the workforce issues uh, ac across all directorates, um, other pressures, I would say, or challenges that we all face, just um, they've appeared already here tonight, is the increasing numbers, increasing volume. So whether that's inward uh, migration or whether it's more people falling into need uh, and the complexity of need. That, that is evident right the way across the council. And obviously that sits in the context that I previously described of the £12 million service efficiencies. So all directorates are constantly and acutely aware of the financial pressures, both in terms of revenue and capital and having to make difficult choices in order to keep us, for us to, to, to work within our means. And therefore, more than ever, this council will have to consider everything through a very, very clear value for money lens. And that means it starts with the need being very clear that we are meeting a need, being clear it's demonstrable need, being clear it's a priority for the council, and then having assured ourselves of that, going out and procuring the solution to that need in the most cost-effective way. We cannot be doing anything that doesn't meet those very, very clear uh, set of considerations. I would also, um, I think probably in terms of overall pressures, I'll, I'll stop there. But the other part of the question was the council wide response was some of those will be in what 
I, I've hope you've previously heard called the Organisation Foundation Programmes. And they are considered to be those most significant council wide objectives, challenges that we must address. And two in particular that will come uh, to councillors in due course will be around uh, something that is in loose hand called sweating our assets. So the council owns quite a number of assets, both building assets and land assets, and it's incumbent on the council to get best possible value and make best possible use of those, uh, whether it's about downsizing, whether it's repurposing, or whether it's even about enhancing in, in, to accommodate other things. So um, sweating our assets and the consideration of all those assets that we work from is going to be a, a really critical piece of work and has been for a little while. And some of that work will come to conclusion in terms of a recommendation this year. Also, we have contracts, commissioning and commercialization. So three C's there. And in all of that, there's a huge amount of money that is spent and we and it starts with commissioning in the best possible way so that we get exactly what we want for the best possible price and then very carefully managing the contractor to ensure this is what is delivered and we 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 get the best outcomes for the best possible price and then going through that process again in terms of commercialization we do not have the luxury of foregoing uh, palatable opportunities of uh, bringing in additional income, whether it's sponsorship, advertising, or um, any other forms of uh, sensibly fees and charges, for example, sensibly embracing new income streams. So th they are two critical uh, responses in terms of a council-wide approach. Uh, but there are many others um, and the work of the medium term financial planning uh, that I've always uh, referenced will will be a huge council wide response to both the pressures this year and those flowing into the next three years from a, both a revenue and capital perspective, because capital is also um, also um, sorry it's come up in this meeting. We also have a considerably higher ambition than we do have the resources to meet it. So again, working within our means and cutting our cloth and making sensible choices, albeit maybe sometimes less palatable than others, uh, is going to be uh, a huge piece of council-wide work going forward. Thank you. And uh, Sally, do you want to say something? Thank you, Chair. Um, and interesting, it's linked to the point that Graham have just made. So we have organisational foundation programmes as described. One of the others that um, is on that list of five uh, big organisational change programmes is actually dedicated to workforce. Um, and that programme is looking at a number of things that Louise has mentioned. Obviously, HR is, is within my portfolio now. Um, and Louise mentioned corporate brand, that's absolutely key to make sure that we are that employer of choice. Um, we also need to be competitive because the local government market is actually um, uh, can, obviously, can obviously be quite challenging. And I think the other aspect for us is that um, we're looking to expand our graduate and our apprenticeship programmes to do, as Graeme said, where we identify critical areas of need. How do we grow our own resources in a difficult, challenging market to meet um, that organisational need so we can serve our community is a really key focus for us as part of our developing people strategy, which we will, as Louise mentioned, take via personnel board, but I'm sure would come and welcome uh, overview and scrutiny's input at an early stage as part of that process. OK, thanks. Um, OK, Chris. Um, this is for Graham. I'm sorry to drag you back to page 36, but it is a general question about our RE3. Uh, RA3, sorry. The target, is that what you would consider to be the break even figure for profitability for the leisure centre or is that at the, the minimum profit level? 
Uh, we currently have a uh, an arrangement with Places Leisure whereby we receive a management fee and that management fee, um, uh, this is a public meeting, so I, I probably won't say a figure, but it's quite sizable. Um, and uh, we, we aren't uh, with the capacity, sorry, with the return that these levels, we, we're getting very close to realizing that management fee again, but it's certainly uh, a surplus generating activity for us through this contract um, and it would have to decline where well, it'd have to drop back somewhat from the quarter four figures to no longer be a surplus obviously um, we had understandably some quite lengthy discussions with the contractor because they had to close they were forced to close it was a force majeure and it wasn't just about the time that they were closed where they couldn't realize any income. Uh, it, there was uh, obviously a, a significant overhang uh, following uh, the the impact of closure that they obviously um, weren't too comfortable with them bearing the full impact of that. So we've had to uh, negotiate quite strenuously and and in a very positive way and we've resolved that now uh so th this has been a really difficult area uh but i'm pleased to say it's now at levels that we're in surplus making for the council and profit i don't use that word shamelessly because profit goes back to paying for social workers and and fixing potholes and what have you um, so yes, this is a, a an income generating activity, and the, the higher we can get that number of patronage, then uh, the the better our management fee will look. Thank you very much for that. And uh, Prue, you'd like to say something? Yes, I, I just want to say that though the numbers are good, not all the leisure centres are performing equally. So. Um, Carnival Pool has obviously given a huge boost, uh, a Carnival Hub, I mean, um, but but it's not a uniform picture, so there is more behind that. I think some some are not doing so well, um, but I'm pleased that we are seeing a receipt from this now, which is good. Sarah yeah, asked that's... specifically to say that that it's not all equal across the across the board. Uh, yeah, just just to add to. Bruce's point. The the biggest disparity, uh, of course, there there are differences in in the performance of the leisure centres, but uh, like I say, overall we we fare well. But in the leisure arena, there are some really difficult um, areas, and they are particularly with um, those more vulnerable. So the return of vulnerable to, like you might have heard of Shine and 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 those types of programs, they they really have suffered and do continue to suffer, and and some of our own sort of commercial, um, intended commercial ventures have suffered a bit. So Prue's absolutely right. It, it's not um, all green and rosy for sure, and and even leisure centres has been really challenging. But the leisure centres is the strongest. In terms of the the whole package of sports and lever, leisure offering, the the universal leisure services are uh, definitely uh, performing more strongly than than others. Okay, Andrew. Yeah, thanks, um, thanks, Chair. Um, I think this discussion on the leisure centres um, is really, really interesting and important, um, and I think it's also. Um, a very good example of where, um, whenever possible, um, you know, if um, members of the committee are able to submit questions um, in advance to officers, sometimes um, it will help the officers to get some of the data that might not be um, available immediately to hand um, 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 uh, to bring to the committee, um, uh, you know, to help us in our deliberation. So it's just a it's just a, um, a a suggestion that you know members uh, consider. Um, if there aren't other questions, I'd like to suggest. Uh, I think it's five um, recommendations um, on this agenda item. Um, 
the first is that for when we look at um, uh, performance indicators, um, we um, uh, usually as a committee, um, I'm getting some st some looks at the moment. No, that's okay. Um, we usually begin by um, uh, thanking um, the executive members and supporting officers for attending the meetings to present, um, in this case, the Q4 rep uh, report, um, and also for answering our members' questions. Um, now, the other uh, recommendations, um, picking up on Andy's, um, uh, Andy's Andy and Adrian's points, um, sorry, I think it was Adrian's points, um, um, I think a recommendation um, that um, um, uh, that um, officers and executive members uh, look at whether or not uh, we should continue to include the background overall um, KPI ch pie charts that were referred to right at the beginning um, of this agenda item. Um, secondly, and closely related to that, that all pie charts um, um, uh, include any non-applicable um, categories in order that they can properly sum to 100 um, percent. There were, a, as I've just alluded to, quite a lot of discussion about um, the, um, uh, leisure centres, um, including the RA3 target. Now, my understanding is, uh, which relates, of course, to borough leisure uh, centres, my understanding is that the KPIs are always uh, set by the executive member and the director of the particular service area. So the recommendation that we might wish to make um, would be that that RA3 target be reviewed um, in view of the improved performance. So going forward, you know, look to perhaps um, increase that target. But then following on, a final recommendation, again related to the issue of leisure centres, that this has generated such interesting and important discussion that perhaps um, we might wish to recommend that this be referred to an appropriate overview and scrutiny committee for uh, further discussion. What that committee might be, I don't know. Um, you know, um, people might wish to make a suggestion. It could be here. It could be, I don't know, corporate and community. I think that depends what aspect you want to look at, because we, Graham spoke about the need for improved activities to um, deter social inclusion, and social inclusion was an issue we looked at in in the past um, at Hosk. So uh, it depends what you want to look at at leisure centres because it does go into you know different things. If you're wanting to look at uh, getting children and young people more involved in leisure centres, then that would be children's. So it's it's a difficult one. Can I just comment and respond to that? I think you're absolutely right, Alison. And I think because it does cut across a number of different areas, perhaps this might be, you know, the appropriate overview and scrutiny committee to, you know, to to explore the issue, but uh, perhaps we can come back to that in the discussions on the forward plan forward yeah, program outside the meeting well. and talk about it outside the meeting in, um, uh, as well. Yeah. Um, there's one point I'd like to add to your list. Um, that's uh, the request for a KPI on the, uh, the, the, the value of the assets. That's a new KPI. Uh, Graham? Yeah, if I put my hand up initially on the um, the point about leisure. In your deliberations, can you try to be as clear as you can about the objective, what you're seeking to do through the scrutiny? Because Alison rightly points out, you can look at this through so many different lenses, um, and obviously that will help us prepare um, for that discussion. So uh, the objective that you're trying to seek will be helpful. On the valuations, can I give that some thought? I, I, it doesn't, I can't readily think of a, a help, helpful way of, of portraying it, but I, I, I get the desire and I'll come back. But you, you also do realise this is a quarterly uh, performance, so I'll just be giving you nothing for Three quarters, and depends yeah, on the I timing. Yeah, I understand that. Yeah, and depends on the timing when the valuations come in, which I can't always control. Uh, you, you, 
Uh, yeah, OK, I, I just need to work through that if I can. Thank you. To make it meaningful. So yes, is um so is everyone happy with the with those recommendations? Okay, so thank you very much. Thank thank you uh, to the officers for uh, your help. Um, and we move on to agenda item ten. Consideration of the current executive and IMD forward programs. Okay, so um, <clears throat> starting at page um, 69, we'll just go through page by page and see if anyone's got any comments on page 69, page 70, page 71, page 72, page 73, Page 74, page 75, and page 76. And then the same for the IM, IM, whatever it is, <laughs> individual executive member forward plan. Uh, page 79 and page 80. Just okay, so we just we just we just note that. Okay. <laughs> Right, um, agenda item 11, Overview and Scrutiny Committee Work Programme. So just for members' information, uh, there was a slightly updated version uh, of the doors you came in. So for the next meeting, we've got the leader and chief executive coming to talk about priorities. Then we've been asked to consider the enhanced bus partnership, which is going to executive in September, and they would like to bring it to this meeting at our next meeting. If members are happy with that. Um, um, if I can, Chair, I, I would, Neil, I would like to ask that, you know, whatever is going to be presented is, is given to us beforehand. Uh, for instance, tonight we didn't get Thames Waters presentation um you know or or i didn't within time but when i looked at the information i didn't see it anyway um and for the bus information i know absolutely nothing about buses so i'll need to see the bus presentation beforehand um that would be my request so we do try to get things out with the agenda including presentations so i can only apologize but Thames Water only gave it to us today. I know they deliver late, so it's not your fault. I'm not getting at you, Neil, far from it. Sorry. Yeah. Um, still on the overview and scrutiny management uh, committee work program. I noted in the minutes of the meeting on the 15th of March that we resolved that additional scrutiny requests from residents, members and town parish councils can be given further uh, consideration by relevant overview and scrutiny committees. Where can these requests be viewed um, and could they be circulated to all overview and scrutiny members that's for all of the committees 
And could we then ask for any suggestions from those members that could go into their various forward programmes? In our case, for this committee, um, my suggestion would be that if there are any suggestions from town, parish councils or indeed residents, that they be considered at the um, at the 18th of July meeting, not discussed, but uh, that consideration be given to whether or not they then go into the forward programme. Yes, we can do that. Al, oh, sorry. Yeah, with with sorry, Andy. So with the, with the July meeting, I'm a little bit concerned. We've got um, so a lot going on in that meeting. So we've got the lead and the chief executive, which is always a big chunky one, and then we've got three others. And I'd, I'm just worried that we're going to have to really squash in the last one, and that we should, if there's one of them which isn't time sensitive, we should perhaps think about moving it. Okay, we'll talk. We'll talk about that at, yeah, outside the meeting, yeah. yeah. Alison, please. Could I ask that the leader and chief executive do send us their presentations in good time? Because that was a big one last year that we only saw on the night. And I think we'd have all benefited from being able to, you know, um, consider it carefully. And even to be able to give them some foresight of the questions we would like to ask. And Chris? Um, the 11th September meeting, uh, air quality. Um, I'm a little bit concerned at how we're going to present this or how it's going to be presented to us when DEFRA's website has no input at all from Wokingham Borough for air quality. There are no sensors that report into the DEFRA website, which is a public access. So how um, is there any idea how we're going to get that metric to measure against this? We've got a target, but how are we going to measure against it? So I'll feed that back. And, and get, let you know what they say. Uh, Andy? Thank you. So again, going back to the lead and chief executive and, and following on from what Alison said, I think, and, and Adrian, um, is there some way of impressing on people that we, if they've given us a presentation, that we don't necessarily have to sit through the same presentation for 20 minutes because it's just a time killer. And if, if they're going to, if officers in particular are going to put together bits of work, there's an expectation that we should have read it and that we can go in cold. Actually, Chair, could, could we ask that you stop any officer reading out their PowerPoint to us? Um, because we, those of us have been on this committee before, <laughs> that often had to sit through people reading it out to us. And if you could, you know, just sort of say, no, we've all read it. Uh, if you've got anything additional to add. Um, because often we waste so much time. And the, the, Adrian, the only reason I smiled a little bit was that the Thames Water presentation was mostly nice pictures. <laughs> what do you mean of sewers? <laughs> OK, thanks. Good point. So from um, from that, so sorry, just going back to um, the July meeting then. Um, you know, I just asked Neil then, do we think, um, you know, we, we're going to talk about this after the meeting, right? Right, OK, I've got that yet. Yeah. Right, OK, so moving on to um, page 86, children's services. No, sorry, Chair, we, we would normally see the whole year a bit more to know what we is suggested for September and and the other meetings. I'm just a little bit surprised that we've only got one meeting forward plan. What? That? So on your way in, there was a, a couple of pieces of paper which included September. Oh yeah, but I meant beyond that, sorry. The rest of the year, normally we'd have the whole year because we've got so much to look at. Have, have, will we will we be having that soon, Neil? Then yes, That's my question. Yes, thank you. Okay, so um, page eighty six, children's services. Any comments? Sorry, just to go back. I don't know if I've missed something. So I carry on. Okay. 
Um, page, all right. Um, and page 87, September meeting. Oh, yeah. If I could perhaps um, make a very brief comment about the Children's Services uh, Forward Programme. Um, and again, I'd welcome any input from you also, Graham, um, on this. Um, uh, I'd like to point out that um, in our last overview of scrutiny management committee, there was a specific request uh, for uh, children's services overview of scrutiny to um, um, uh, to include school, school sufficiency. It is something which we do routinely, but you'll see that that is in next week's 20th of June um, meeting. Um, and uh, in light of the discussion tonight about recruitment, retention and so forth, uh, you'll see in the 6th of September meeting um, is a specific agenda item on that. The Children's Services Forward Programme is very, very packed indeed. We are very, very aware of that. OK, um, um, we do try to um, uh, manage that um, you know, as best we can, but it is really quite a challenge um, at the moment. I don't know, Graham, if you've got anything else to add on that. I would agree, but uh, on the other hand, it's Hobson's choice. We've we've got a lot going on in children's, and it has to be done. And we know that the meeting next week, for example, uh, we've had to put in uh, home school transport for a number of reasons, which has further exacerbated the problem but it's Hobson's choice. OK, um, so yeah, another more packed meetings in September then. And uh, yeah. um, page 88, oh, so this is going always forward through through the year. Yeah. Page 88, page 89, and then, oh, page 90, climate emergency. Overview scrutiny forward plan. It's it's very small because we've got the whole report coming to us, and then we're going to out of that meeting we'll decide what our priorities are for the year. Okay, thank you. Um, so corporate and community and corporate overview and scrutiny committee, page ninety one. Yeah. And so, page 92, I see we've got bus strategy. Is that a duplication? It's not a. Is that. Is that Where's the bus strategy? Sure. We've just we've just had buses, haven't we? I think that the the first buses is the bus implementation program. Oh, right. Whereas this is like a general look at everything to do with highways, but they haven't decided what. On the looks of it. Yeah, so on that one, there's a number of highways issues that were suggested at the last uh, committee meeting, and um, I'm liaising with the officers at the moment to pin down a couple of relevant ones that can come to that meeting. And just a, an omission from that um, for the next meeting on the third of July. Um, We've got uh, George is coming along alongside Graham to talk about their priorities for the uh, for the year ahead, their strategic priorities. So place and growth and resources and assets uh, directorate priorities are coming uh, in place of the what you've got in your agenda pack, which is the arts and culture strategy update that's being moved to a future meeting. Alison, I wondered if uh, corporate community might have a look at the grass cutting uh policy and operation again because it's something we we did a deep dive into about three years ago and then reviewed the progress of it two years ago and I know at the moment it's something that we've probably all had our, our residents filling our inboxes with uh, I... obviously that's a question for the chair of corporate and community uh I think we'll, we'll pass that on to the chair of corporate and community. Yes, which is Chris. Yeah. 
Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we, we just we just we just we'll just note that then. Yeah. Okay. Um. I'll stress you. So. So. Ooh. Is that what? Right. So, um, item 12, agenda item 12, the action tracker report. Andrew. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, I just wanted to, um, uh, to note um, that I continue to find the action trackers that are not being used not only now for overview and scrutiny management, but I believe a number of overview and scrutiny uh, committees. If there are any that are not using the action trackers, I think that um, uh, it would be very worthy of us to consider recommending that they do, because I find that they are very useful. I think that this, um, uh, it was really pleasing, you know, to see that um, uh, all of the actions were up to date. Thank you, Neil and others for, um, you know, for uh, facilitating that, including the six monthly visit by the leader and the C uh, CEO to our next overview and scrutiny management committee. Um, I think it's really, really important, you know, that we make sure that they are uh, planned into those individuals' programs, um, you know, for the whole, um, you know, throughout for the whole of the municipal year. So that's an ongoing rolling uh, sort of feature. But I think the action trackers are excellent. Um, and I think it's really pleasing to see that everything has been completed or is uh, under underway. OK, and any other comments on the? Yeah, I mean, this meeting hasn't been that boring, but I felt for the last I don't know how many minutes that time has been dragging. So can somebody put some batteries in that clock? Because it's it died at 16 minutes past. OK, so I think that, that's the end of the meeting. OK, thank you. Thank you. Very much. Thank you, Chair.